This meeting is being recorded and or transcribed. All right. Uh, I think we're recording now. So uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Cannabis Control Board in Vermont. Today is Thursday, uh, July 15th. It's 9.30, and I'm calling this meeting to order. I have a few administrative comments before we move to the agenda. Um, there is some federal news uh, yesterday. Senators Schumer, Booker, and Wyden uh, released the Cannabis Administration Opportunity Act yesterday. Um, from a very broad perspective, this uh, bill proposes to reschedule cannabis federally, um, ensure that interstate commerce uh, can be achieved, and importantly would allow for automatic expungement of cannabis convictions and it also has um, a number of grant programs to promote social equity. Um, we'll uh, get this up on our website later today for anyone who's interested in any of the details of that. Um, we have two positions posted. Um, we have an administrative services coordinator position and we have a general counsel position. Um, our administrative services manager position uh, closed on Tuesday and we have a number of good applicants there that we're going to start uh, scheduling interviews with. And um, later today on the agenda you'll see that we are going to be taking a vote on our consulting services contract. Uh, so we'll be announcing the names of the people that are the finalists for those. Um, and uh, yesterday also, I believe it was public, but the um, full advisory committee of the Cannabis Control Board has now been appointed. And so we'll get those names up on our website uh, soon. So today we're gonna continue our fact finding into the priorities that we've identified in Act 164 and Act 62. Um, today's meeting is dedicated to some of the energy and environmental concerns related to cult cannabis cultivation. Um, you know, we know that indoor cannabis cultivation is the most intensive agricultural crop in the United States. Um, and we've done a lot of good work in this state uh, to reduce our carbon footprint, electrify the grid, build out our renewable energy sources and promote efficiency. And so we really don't want to drop the ball um, and undo some of that good work by taking um, you know, by indoor cannabis cultivation um, and figuring out how we can kind of do that safely and uh, effectively. So under Act 164, um, both the Public Utility Commission and uh, the Department of Public Service uh, were asked to provide the Cannabis Board with some recommendations around best practices with energy consumption and cannabis cultivation. Um, we have uh, a number of great witnesses today, but we're going to hear first from uh, the Public Service Department um, to walk us through some of those recommendations and really orient us to energy concerns as they relate to cannabis. Um, before we do that, um, I think we should approve the minutes from our meeting on July 13th. I'll move to approve the minutes from July 13th. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Hi. So uh, we have a packed agenda. I'm just going to start moving directly to our witnesses. Our first uh, two witnesses are TJ Poor um, and Barry Murphy, both from the uh, Vermont Public Service Department. Hi, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and uh, you know, this is my first uh, kind of hybrid online and in-person meeting. So I, I think it looks pretty good so far. So great, <laughs> great job. Um, Don't uh, it. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so, and uh, congratulations on you all getting established uh, pretty quickly after getting appointed and moving moving pretty quickly. Uh, um, it's, it's great. Um, and I uh, look forward to be one, in, one of your early witnesses here. So, um, uh, uh, for the record, I'm TJ Poor. I'm the Director of Efficiency and Energy Resources at the Department of Public Service. And with me today is Barry Murphy, Energy Programs Manager here. And um, we submitted some recommendations to you on the energy standards for cannabis establishments. And uh, we will uh, look to talk about that today. I am going to uh, pull up a presentation. I 
I think we sent this um, sent this to you, but I, I can just run the slides from here if that works. Okay, can you all see my screen? We can. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, I'll run through a couple of high level things, give you a sense of our approach and then leave it to Barry to really talk about the technical details of the recommendations. Um, so uh, I wanted to first orient you to who we are and, and what we really do. I'm not sure how familiar you are to the Department of Public Service, but uh, really we're the ratepayer advocate and what that, uh, what that means is we represent the public interest in matters regarding energy, telecommunications, water, wastewater, and that really including the least cost planning oversight for electric distribution and efficiency utilities. So there's a lot of jargon in there, but least cost planning is really uh, making sure that our energy services are provided with an eye towards cost effectiveness that includes both economic and environmental concerns. So our charges are littered all over statute, but we have uh, affordability, reliability of the electric system, uh, greenhouse gas requirements that we need to plan for, renewable energy requirements, et cetera, um, and the breadth of uh, our utility regulation and planning. Um, to that end, we also developed the Comprehensive Energy Plan. We're in the midst of that process now, um, distinct from the Climate Council's Climate Action Plan. The Energy Plan sets a vision for Vermont. Uh, right now, it's 90% 90, 90 renewable by 2050, and has actions to kind of to get there. Um, and we're we're developing that and and looking at it as a strategic plan this year. Um, we also serve as the State Energy Office. Um, uh, partnering with uh, the Depart Federal Department of Energy, um, uh, you know, focus on innovation and new programs. Make sure we're implementing best practices in the state. Uh, and then we maybe most relevant for today is that we update and promulgate rules for commercial building energy standards and residential energy standards. Mm -hmm. uh, in doing that, we run a large stakeholder process where we. Um, get a lot of input on on what the codes should be, and then we issue rules and uh, rulemaking. Uh, and we do a lot more, but that kind of just I just wanted to give you a sense of um, you know our perspective of really looking for cost effectiveness, best available technology at the least cost, and kind of trying to balance upfront cost with um, long term payback plus environmental concerns while ensuring everybody is served by energy. So um, just, uh, just a few, uh, few tasks there. Um, but getting into the, the today's presentation, what I really uh, will cover is the, um, we'll go over quickly what the department's charge was, we're specifically called out in X-164, and then um, talk about a few specific statutory considerations and how we approach the statute. Briefly, just talk about what we did in developing the code. And then, as I said before, when we get into the recommendations, that purple box there will really be Barry's area to uh, dive into what our re recommendations actually are. So, um, as I said, Act 164 called out specifically uh, the Public Service Department and asked us to provide recommendations to, to you all uh, that include uh, the statutory language is up here on the screen. They include recommended building energy standards, recommended energy audits, and then energy efficiency and conservation me measures for cannabis establishments. Um, Specifically, um, we I want we wanted to call this one out because um, the that language on the previous slide um, said we should make recommendations whether there should be building energy standards if those recommendations should be different from commercial building standards, and so we we take that as it, uh, implying that commercial building energy standards at a minimum would would apply and. Uh, as we do that, 
um, we found that, hey, there's no definitions or requirements for greenhouses in the CBs. If I use or Barry uses CBs, that's CBES, that's just the acronym for commercial building energy standards. Um, and because greenhouses are typically exempt um, through an exemption of farm structures within the CBs statute, but then also in statute, uh, it makes it clear that cannabis growing establishments are not not supposed to be regulated as farming or considered an agricultural or rural co crop. And so that means then they don't fall into that exemptions from CBs that's in the rule. And so that means CBs needs to apply. And so that's the kind of minimum standard. So with that, we what Barry will present is that there are uh, our recommendations include both recommendations for you know commercial buildings, no, normal buildings, and then also for greenhouses. Um, this this slide just shows really a group the the folks that we uh, reached out to and engaged with um, as we uh, as we developed our standards. So um, amongst state agencies, the Public Utilities Commission specifically called out in statute, Agency of Agriculture, um, Public Safety, Fire Safety. Um, we also worked with the uh, Energy Efficiency Utilities, Efficiency Vermont, who I know is on the schedule later on today, and Burlington Electric Vermont Gas, uh, because they really uh, are um, the ones that implement our efficiency measures. We, we do oversight of them, but they're program designers. And so they have a lot of good input. And in particular, Efficiency Vermont uh, also has program uh, uh, key account managers and program managers that can connect us with um, the folks on the ground. And we asked them and they they did actually connect us and get to get input from, um, from growers and people who would really be affected by this. Uh, these rules. Uh, we also, uh, in the bottom right, uh, National Buildings Institute was our contractor. They do code work across the country and have been involved in uh, in writing energy standards uh, on cannabis growing establishments elsewhere. Uh, we connected with Massachusetts, who just uh, recently uh, promulgated their rules for um, for energy standards for cannabis growing establishments. And the Resource Innovation Institute, who uh, is a nonprofit who advocates for really efficient growing practices, essentially, if I, if I sum that up correctly. Um, in the bottom there is kind of is our process. I realized I left something out in this slide, but you know we had a, initial meetings with folks, um, you, you know, small groups of one or two or three of these organizations, uh, so that we could develop a straw proposal. Um, what I left out is we put that straw proposal out for comment and and got um, got a lot of great feedback. We revised that proposal uh, and then um, gave another opportunity for written comments. And you know, throughout this time, we also uh, engaged uh, engaged stakeholders in meetings as well. and um, and then we ultimately leading to the final proposal that you see uh, you have before you. Um, to our knowledge or to my knowledge and Barry can correct me if I'm wrong um, but we are not aware of any objection to these standards um, and I think that is a result of the the process that we we went through um, um, so with that I'll, I'll uh, Give Barry a little better introduction. He's a energy programs manager at the Department of Public Service. He is uh, he's he's been at the department for uh, over a decade now. Um, he does a lot of oversight of our commercial programs, uh, commercial efficiency programs in, in terms of value unification, and is really our technical expert. He he's the one that runs the process for the uh, commercial building energy stand standards update and make sure that um, you know, we're we're putting in the uh, we're we're requiring the best available cost effective technology that um, that that we can and so I uh, probably still didn't do you justice Barry but I'm going to turn it over to you now <laughs> hey good morning um, as TJ said um, we 
went through a uh, compressed but fairly extensive process uh, in order to arrive at these recommendations. Um, and obviously, you've read them all. Um, your understanding, obviously, not being experts in this particular area is uh, not perfect. So what I was thinking I would do is rather than read back to your recommendations, is try and provide um, some color to them and some explanation, et cetera, as to you know why we got there and what that actually practically means in terms of uh, what has to be done within a building. So if we uh, can go to the next slide, please. DJ? Is it not showing up on your screen? It went on mine. Oh, there we go. There we go. It there just go. took a little bit of time. Um, so as TJ said, um, or Mr. Poor, I forgot, sorry. <laughs> as, uh, as was commented previously, um, when we looked at this, we realized that we we're going to have to look at greenhouses as well as um, normal buildings. Um, greenhouses is very much a different um, beast for us, as it were, uh, to look at because it's something that we've never considered or had to regulate or think about regulating previously. Um, so that took a, a fair amount of um, review, which is why we bifurcated uh, the recommendations of the greenhouses and uh, normal buildings. You might hear me uh, refer to them as uh, opaque buildings, but these recommendations will apply to obviously opaque buildings and mixed light buildings as well equally. Um, and greenhouses obviously are a separate track again, depending upon obviously the uh, the amount of mixed light building you're talking about. They might technically slide into the greenhouse category, but that's a definition that is yet to be uh, decided uh, by yourselves. Um, so we're concentrating on basically one, two, like five, six main areas. As you, as you can see from this table, uh, the majority of what we're recommending for the peak buildings is basically just CVs, maybe with a few minor modifications, but for the most part, um, the recommendations within the commercial building energy standards are entirely applicable to this process, except for specific areas such as the growing areas, et cetera, uh, where we obviously have to have slightly different considerations due to the conditions within that space. Um, greenhouses, again, um, is, a, is a new thing for us. So I had to do a lot of learning uh, as far as this went. But um, as we get into the specifics, if you have any um, questions on anything or you're looking for any additional clarification on things, please do let me know. I will just be more than happy to uh, delve a little bit deeper than um, I might have done otherwise. If you can go to the next slide, please. Okay, it, it so, went on mine, so hopefully it went, this is working. <laughs> it went. Good. So for uh, indoor buildings uh, or, or opaque wall buildings, basically we're, requ we're recommending that the envelope just be Stevie's. No, th th there's no need to change that. Um, same for the lighting requirements, apart from the um, growing areas. Um, for those areas, obviously, um, we needed to consider a whole new uh, metric and measure, uh, which was uh, photosynthetic photon effic efficacy which until um, we started these, I'd never heard of. Um, and as a result, it took a little bit of um, digging to understand what it actually meant. Now, lighting in these spaces is very intensive. You know, they use an awful lot of energy, um, which is why we um, done research and we eventually decided to go with the uh, 1.9 for these buildings. Now the the photo the PPE because I don't want to say photosynthetic photon efficacy too often because I'll just trip over it. Uh, the PPE is basically it's a measure of input energy versus output that you're looking for. So the higher the number, the better. Um, once you get above two, uh, basically you're um, locking and using only LED lights. Um, one of the major comments that we got from a lot of um, the stakeholders that we talked to was that while LEDs are efficient, 
a lot of the growers aren't convinced that they produce the same results as uh, metal halide lights, um, which is why you know, ultimately when we decided on the 1.9, um, we decided that that brings us to the threshold for LED, and but it still it still allows for double-ended metal halide, which is that most high-efficient metal halide lights you can get, um, to be used to allow comfort level, shall we say, for for growers and others in uh, Vermont. It's still an efficient light, but it's not quite as efficient as the LED. But as I said, it does allow for that choice uh, for the growers, et cetera, within Vermont. Um, it was the same um, issue with um, CVs uh, as far as the HVAC or heating and ventilation um, systems go. Um, what we discovered through our um, research was that for spaces that are used for growing, generally it's high heat, high humidity. And a lot of our standard um, requirements, such as heat recovery and um, economizers on the system, would not would be counterintuitive as far as putting serving those spaces. Um, for instance, heat recovery could promote mold within the space, and economizers would never actually run particularly well uh, when serving those space spaces, and they would just basically use a whole lot of energy and not actually deliver much benefit. So that's part of the reason why our recommendation would be that we would be exempting that portion of the building, not the entire building, but the growing portion from the building from being served by heat recovery and economizers as well. Um, and obviously there's different ways that they do growing within these buildings, such as you know, the carbon dioxide enrichment, which I frankly had never heard of before until now, um, which is going to require different standards as far as the ventilation go, but I believe that fire safety, et cetera, will be um, addressing that particular issue um, as far as um, their own recommendations and requirements go for um, growing within these spaces. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So as I say, greenhouses, totally new environment for us and um, obviously far different from a, a normal commercial building. Um, there have been some standards developed um, around greenhouses within the IECC, which um, 2021, um, currently our code is based on the 2018 version of the International Energy Conservation Code, which is what the IECC stands for. Um, but those requirements um, are slightly different from what we are going to be recommending here. For, for example, we're recommending an envelope of a, with a U value of 0 0.7. What that practically means is um, a double poly wall with an air gap um, or you know, double um, greenhouse glass, et cetera, just to improve the thermal uh, resilience of um, a greenhouse, especially if that greenhouse is going to be used for year-round growing. Um, because obviously, um, if you're going to be heating those spaces to uh, high temperatures in order to promote growth, especially over the winter, you're going to have an awful lot of energy lost um, as a result of growing it within a greenhouse. Um, whether or not that's ultimately a, a path that is um, chosen um, by the grower. It's something obviously that they, they would have to be aware of as far as um, their overall energy costs were going to be. Uh, moving on to lighting, you'll notice that we uh, recommend a lighting uh, PPE of 1.7, which is less than that which we um, looked at within uh, opaque wall buildings. Um, the reason for that is um, basically we received comment um, regarding uh, having the same standard for greenhouses as um, opaque wall buildings. And when we done a little bit more review and research, et cetera, on the issue, we discovered that in terms of the hours of use associated with um, lighting, additional lighting within a greenhouse versus the actual cost of it, you never actually would make back um, the energy costs 
Um, you'd never save this as much money, sorry, um, in the energy costs as you would um, if you had put in the higher requirement of the lamp, the 1.9 lamp. You would never make that money back. Um, so I, as a result, we felt it was reasonable to um, require a 1.7, a slightly lower standard, which is coincidentally also the same standard that um, is required in many other places as far as um, greenhouses go. Um, HVAC equipment, not necessarily something you would traditionally see in a greenhouse, obviously. That, what you're going to see there is mostly um, fans, etc., in order to move the um, air around. Um, but obviously, should they decide to install an HVAC system, it would be having to meet CV's requirements, etc. Um, we do have some out as far as uh, greenhouses go, as you are probably aware. Um, Greenhouses that only use a uh, relatively low amount of energy annually uh, for heating uh, would be exempt. I forget exactly what that number is at this point, I'm afraid, but it's fairly low. Um, so they would be exempt from um, the requirements for HVAC, etc., as well as the envelope. Um, basically, because all they're doing is using uh, a small amount of um, energy in order to extend the growing seasons into the shoulder months. Mm -hmm. Uh, rather than year-round cultivation. Um, and the other piece is that you know, lighting associated with um, growing as well. Uh, if the total load is less than 40 kW, um, again, the intent there is that it would only be used for um, extending the growing period um, and the, the shoulder seasons. Um, and that is all reasonably consistent with what other uh, jurisdictions have done um, and also reflected a lot of the comments that we had received initially when we had proposed um, something a little bit more stricter. Um, if there's no additional, if, sorry, additional questions, if there's no questions, um, I can certainly move on to the next uh, page. Uh, I, have a, I have a question, Barry. Um, first of all, thank, thank you to you and, and TJ for getting us these recommendations so <clears throat> early in the process. I had a question about, about I guess, the envelope portion of this conversation, and maybe it's, maybe it's better suited for colleagues at Efficiency Vermont or colleagues at the Agency of Agriculture. You know, coming from the Agency of Ag, I used to be in the room when farm structure determinations were made. Um, from time to time, I recognized that the greenhouses in state kind of run the gamut of uh, you know, what kind of condition they're in, um, what age they are, you know, so on and so forth. So how attainable is, you know, that minimum standard for, at, at a, from a broad stroke view, 30,000 foot view um, of the greenhouses that are currently, you know, in existence in the state and, and what kind of cost would be associated with getting them up to these standards, recognizing that a lot of these you know, folks with these greenhouses may not have had to really make sure that they're up to you know commercial business code um as i understand it efficiency vermont actually does run programs um around greenhouses and the the u of 0 0.7 is actually one of the um factors that they try and attain as to the actual cost effectiveness etc of it um i can't State categorically what that is, but I would say that if, if, if Efficiency Vermont is running a program, then it has to be cost effective. That is one of the statutory requirements um, that EVT have when it comes to um, you know, deploying measures, et cetera, uh, within the state. Um, one of the things I didn't necessarily address when I was talking about envelope was um, uh, air barrier testing um, and air barrier requirements. We aren't recommending, obviously, that. Um, there be an air barrier requirement, but we would obviously encourage it, which obviously would minimize you know, large air leakages and thus you know, heat, et cetera. Um, but I, as I said, as I understand it, you know, the program that Efficiency Vermont runs is basically attaining this value of, of 0 0.7. Um, and as I said earlier, it is attainable through air gaps, uh, double poly walls. Um, so it would, Theoretically, I guess it would uh, maybe double the cost of material um, and probably a little bit of additional labor time. 
but much beyond that, um, I would defer to my uh, colleague Lauren when she is going to be uh, presenting uh, a little bit later. I'm sure she would be more than happy to address the issue of cost effectiveness as far as um, that requirement goes. Yeah, I can jump in now, Barry, so I don't forget to um, to address this. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, right now, we require um, a double poly um, for polyethylene covered greenhouses, and that would get folks, um, the double poly with an air barrier would get folks to this U value of 0.7. Um, so this requirement would basically um, require folks to use a um, double poly on their greenhouses. That's becoming more common, so we didn't feel like it was that difficult for folks to meet, particularly if they're growing year round um, and heating the greenhouse. Um, that's uh, very reasonable in a Vermont climate. Um, and I think on glass greenhouses, um, the 0.7 U value requires them to have some kind of efficient coating um, associated with the glass greenhouses. Um, so we didn't feel like this was particularly difficult if folks were um, going to be growing cannabis year round. Um, if you were growing produce or other types of um, greens or plants, um, you may not need um, this level of uh, poly on your greenhouses um, and it's not required for them uh, right now as other agricultural crops, um, but this seemed totally reasonable. Um, it is because we currently run a program um, from uh, an existing single poly to a double poly, um, if this becomes the energy code, re code requirement, we wouldn't be running probably that program around um, a double poly because that would be the baseline. Um, so just something to note, we do currently do that program. Um, if this were to be the energy code, um, we, we would probably stop doing that for cost effectiveness reasons as Barry mentioned. Thanks, Lauren. Look forward to hearing more from you later. Barry, I didn't mean to detract from, <laughs> from your presentation, but as, as Lauren indicated, I know, you know, depending on your operation, if it's diversified, if you're doing other things with produce and greenhouses, some of this may be new to folks that are, you know, looking to jump into this space and just wanted to make sure that everybody who's listening understands uh, where the standards going not just here if this is what we go with but, but where standards are going in other jurisdictions as we look at growing in greenhouses year-round of course yes that, that's perfectly understandable i mean as um uh, mr Pepper mentioned earlier the um the growth of cannabis is extremely energy intensive um i think it's something along the lines of like 300 percent more energy intensive than growing tomatoes in a greenhouse so obviously everything you can do to minimize energy use and heat loss, et cetera, when you're doing that is something that should be encouraged and required uh, right. when you're dealing with such a, a high energy use industry. Um, so I, if there's nothing else, I'll move on to our next slide. Okay. So, um, Obviously, the next part that we were kind of like charged with looking at were um, recommendations around energy audits. Um, we had a lot of discussions around this internally, whether or not it would be uh, something that would be required as far as you know, annual third party audits looking at um, you know, energy use and buildings and analysis, et cetera. Uh, what we ultimately ended up with is a um, similar model to many other jurisdictions um, that deployed, which basically results in a self-reporting um, methodology uh, where they would, they would basically report to yourselves uh, their annual energy use um, along with their um, reduction numbers. Uh, which would allow us to obviously, um, you know, dividing one by the other, give us a, a kind of either grams per uh, kilowatt hour or kilograms per megawatt hour, you know, whatever ratio it is that um, you know, ultimately would be decided upon. Um, that would allow us to basically track the energy intensive nature of that building um, over time and allow us to see uh, if there's any like large increases in energy use or decreases in energy use, um, which would allow us to um, obviously flag um, areas of concern 
as far as um, large upswings in energy use, but not a similarly um, large um, increase in uh, production um, as um, being indicative that there is something changed within that facility that would be uh, worthwhile having uh, investigated to make sure that um, there is nothing wrong or there's that they're still following um, the recommendations uh, or requirements by the Canvas Control Board as to um, their uh, energy efficiency. Um, there's a number of different tools that can be done with that in order to establish those baselines. Um, there's obviously there's a portfolio manager. Um, it doesn't allow um, like tracking of production within that, but that should be straightforward enough um, in order to you know, do a comparison from information, the energy use information that would be contained within Portfolio Manager and any production information that would, they would uh, provide. Also, one of the stakeholders um, that uh, we consulted with, RII, uh, they have a proprietary software tool which does allow both tracking of energy and production within it. Um, and I believe Massachusetts uses that or uses a version of that uh, for their um, growers within the state. Um, so, I mean, both these tools, obviously, they exist, and there is likely uh, more other options out there um, as far as um, being able to track both energy and production. Um, Very quick question. Say, Yes. Yeah. So that proprietary software through RII, just just curious, is that, and you might not know the answer. I think you said Massachusetts operates on that platform. Is that something the state operates and folks kind of update, you know, their numbers in accordance with their license, or is that proprietary software that each individual license holder would you know, seek themselves? As I understand it, it's um, an individual, each grower, the state requires them to use that tool and the state is given limited access into each of uh, the grower's accounts so that they can you know, view um, the information that's uh, presented within there. Um, okay, thank you. And obviously, uh, as far as you know, establishing what a particular baseline would be for any building, um, I would probably think that you're looking at um, looking at the energy use and cultivation uh, production of year two rather than year one, mostly because it would take time for um, the buildings to kind of um, get their processes etc. in order, and so basically trying to establish a baseline on uh, their year one production and energy use is probably going to result in a lot of um, issues um, as far as um, knowing whether or not they're actually on track and meeting the energy efficiency uh, requirements and they're producing as um, effectively and efficiently as they could. Um, if we move on to the next slide, please. So one of our other recommendations um, was that all of these buildings um, be required to be solar ready. Um, within the CBs, we have Appendix CA, uh, which basically determines um, how that can be done. Um, in most cases, you know, it, it involves looking at orientation of a building in terms of sun, exposure, shading, et cetera. Um, also requires you know, identification of pathways for conduit, et cetera, and keeping um, space within an electrical panel for the appropriate size breaker in order to have the solar um, on that roof. Uh, for greenhouses, obviously it's a little bit different, but you know, if they are in an appropriate space for solar, then you know they should identify a, an area where that could be done and have space within a breaker. And so it's all relatively high level. Um, and relatively cost-free um, as far as um, that requirement goes. Uh, within CBs, we do have a um, building type specific requirement for the amount of solar they would have to put on a roof. Um, obviously, um, facilities uh, such as this is not wasn't considered when we developed that list. Um, so we have uh, looked at 
those requirements and we're we would recommend that if a building were to decide to install sol and install solar don't know why that was so hard uh, the uh would require to do a minimum of 0 0.5 watts per square foot of the floor area of their building or greenhouse um that number is actually rather conservative um the the intent when we were setting these numbers within CVs and this number is to set a minimum threshold, but hope that when people look at it in terms of overall cost effectiveness, they would realize that they could actually install a whole lot more solar. Uh, but there's a vast difference between requiring people to put something in and encouraging them to do more. <laughs> and we're trying to encourage them to do more rather than require, because what we would find is that people would just put in the bare minimum um, rather than look beyond what was uh, available to them to actually do in terms of cost effectiveness. Um, another piece uh, that's in here is um, something that's uh, near and dear to my heart, um, and that being uh, the ventilation systems, um, having a filter capable of removing or reducing the odor from uh, plant drying, if it's within a, a mile or so of the premises. Uh, the reason I brought that up is that um, I live very close to a farm that is growing hemp. And while the smell of the drying plant isn't terrible, um, it is intrusive and is very noticeable. Um, so obviously if you have a large facilities, et cetera, that are doing this and they're doing it year round, um, I can imagine that if they're close to uh, any kind of residential area, et cetera, um, this would be a welcome um, addition to uh, their systems um, on behalf of their neighbors. Um, and the final uh, recommendation was the use of thermal curtains for greenhouses that um, operate year round, again, to uh, try and minimize that heat loss over um, the winter period. Um, we have had great success with programs similar to this um, within the tier three world, um, which is a program that we run in concert with the uh, distributing utilities or the electric utilities um, and um, efficiency Vermont um, that we've used for uh, tomato growers, et cetera. Um, and it's really been successful in reducing um, overall energy costs, especially during the winter months. Um, and I believe if um, we go to the next slide, it's uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> So if, is there any clarifications, any additional questions, any um, comments, thoughts that you might wish to um, bring up at this point? I don't think at this point, I, I have a few questions for the end, but why don't we get through the presentation? Well, is that essentially it? So that was the end. I, okay. have, <laughs> I have some questions on licensing conditions. Sure. If you might, don't mind jumping back. So this this um, ability to serve letter uh, from a DU, um, you know, I oh. can imagine that being kind of part of um, the application process. But I'm curious, you know, from a, a not in this industry, but other regulated industries, from a commercial perspective, is, is our processes with DUs to kind of demonstrate that they have this capacity? Is that is that infrastructure, for lack of a better way to describe it, already in place? Or is that something that we've got to work with DUs potentially to kind of to set up so folks that would be reaching out to these DUs um, know where to start and you know so on and so forth? I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit more about about how that process would, would look. Yeah, I, I can certainly do that. And I also will, will apologize because I realize I skipped this slide. Uh, so uh, that, that's entirely that's entirely on me. But I, I seen uh, uh, Mr. Poor looked very eager to answer that question. So, uh, well, you you may be able to um, to chime in too here, Barry. But I, um, you know, ability to serve letters are are a normal thing for anybody who uh, establishes a new connection. Uh, okay. or has kind of a major re re uh, renovation. And so uh, utilities have to um, uh, have to provide that and know that they have an ability to serve. Um, you know, think about a, 
um, a ski resort who wants to expand snowmaking operations or something uh, or build a new lodge, um, they'll need to get an ability to serve letter because you know, that could require new lines or a substation. And and part of the reason for that is so that the utility can do the analysis and ensure that um, you know the, the goal is to not have all ratepayers subsidize one business. Um, and so right. if the answer is no, then there's there's a number of options. You could add you know other distributed technologies to kind of limit the the amount of demand. You could be interruptible, um, or you could, uh, pay for upgrades, whether it's going to three phase or, or um, you know, in an extreme scenario, um, a substation. I, I don't know that that would be the case here, but it, the ski resort example, that's that's a case sometimes. Yeah, uh, assuming that we're not in those extreme <laughs> settings, uh, what's the typical timeline from from engagement with the DU to getting that official ability to serve letters secured? Uh, it's relatively quickly. I can't remember the exact uh, timeline, but um, uh, it's something we could get back to on. I, I think it's within a month or two uh, at, okay. at the most. Yeah, and obviously to that point, um, part of what would be required is that the grower or corporation or whoever it is that is seeking this ability to serve later would have to have a a reasonably firm understanding of what their electrical load was going to be um, at the time that they would um, be applying for it, which is, which brings us to the, the piece that, and as I said, I, I apologize for skipping this slide because it is rather key, um, that you know, the completion of an energy management plan, which would include um, like um, doing some analysis around what their expected electrical load and energy load would actually be um, so that they could, um, as I said, you know, provide that information to any of the, the utilities uh, to make sure that they would be able to supply that load on any particular, on the particular circuit. Because as TJ said, um, it could very well be that where they're planning to put it, there's only a two phase power and they might have to run a three phase line or there would have to be transformer upgrades, et cetera. Um, and obviously the issue there is that if you're going to do that, then where should the um, burden of that cost necessarily fall? Um, you know, our general viewpoint is that the, the person that is creating the burden should be the one that's mostly responsible for um, paying for those upgrades rather than the rate payer as a whole. Um, but within that energy management plan, um, not only would you be looking at in terms of you know, how much energy you're using, but how you would be meeting uh, the requirements as required by the, the board, um, what kind of envelope you're doing, including your air ceiling, you know, how your lighting is going to be set up, you know, your HVAC, your controls, et cetera. Um, all of these things would be identified within a plan, which would allow, um, when it's been reviewed, you know, a, a good understanding of what's been planned along with giving you a reference for how that building should be operating into the future, um, which means that if any changes, et cetera, happen, you have a good reference to as to what the baseline building was originally. And I would probably recommend that if there's any major updates or changes to a building that that energy management plan be updated every time they come in for relicensing, assuming there is going to be a relicensing process, which obviously I don't think you've decided yet or not. I know I have a dominating question. So. I've got a just quick follow up on that, and maybe you've answered it already and I missed it. Um, can the ability to serve happen remotely? Can the utility company kind of just look at it you know, internally, or do they have to do a site visit? As I understand it, the ability to serve is entirely based upon um, the circuit that the building is going to be placed on and the, the, the loads and demands that are currently there. And, then with the projected additional loads and demands of the new building, whether or not it, that circuit would remain within tolerance and for capacity, et cetera, meaning that it is still able to serve um, all the loads that are currently on it, as well as the new load, and still have um, additional capacity within that in order to make sure that those, if there's any uh, large events such as, you know, weather, et cetera, where you know, people are running lots of air conditioning, 
um, on that circuit, as well as the, um, the the growing facility, that there's going to be enough um, room, I guess, within the wire to run that additional power without you know, causing any issues. Yeah. And it's um, um, the process, just one more thing on that process. Um, it, it's a little different for each utility, but you know, for example, Green Mountain Power, there's <clears throat> there's a web page where there's a form you can just you know e uh, it opens to an email address that you can submit the relevant information, and um, if everything's all good, you'll just get a letter mailed to you basically, um, and you know the information just like Barry said, just info on the facility, whether it's new construction, expansion, the the type of use, the motors, the air conditioning, the lighting, et cetera. And, uh, and then they can, they can do an analysis of the circuit. Yeah, thanks. Is, is, sorry, I got one question. And then I'm yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> is there any hesitation from your office? And I recognize you might not be well suited to answer this question. It might be better suited for the utilities, but I would imagine um, there's going to be a lot of interest in the more rural corners of the state. Is there any hesitation that the utilities that service our more rural areas, you know, in northern Vermont, so on and so forth, won't have enough capacity to potentially meet energy demand? Or, or no, uh, at this point, no. Um, you know, at the high level, at the transmission level, there's there's headroom in the system, and then for the some of the for now um, and then some of the smaller utilities especially in the north actually load is a really good thing because there's more generation in the northern part of the state than there is load right now and so okay. uh, it actually w would help to soak up um, soak up uh, some of the renewable en energy generation in the area as opposed to right now some of it's curtailed um, at, at cost to ratepayers so um, actually, those are good places to, to put into this. Great. I just didn't want the more rural areas to feel like they're up against another barrier, you know. Yeah, no, no really in this one, the it actually is the other way. I think there's a, an advantage to citing it in Vermont Electric's territory or elsewhere in the northern part of the state, especially. Thank you. Um, I just have a, a clarifying question, and forgive me if I've missed or misunderstood something. Your recommendations apply regardless of the size of the greenhouse. Is that right? So if somebody has a small greenhouse versus a very large greenhouse or very large building, the same recommendations apply. Well, again, that's where the um, the overall um, load of the building would come in. For instance, a, a small greenhouse would likely not use the same amount of energy. So it could very well uh, be exempt from some of these requirements simply due to the total energy use. Same with the lighting uh, piece, simply due to the size of it, it might not have um, such a large um, overall energy footprint, which would mean it would fit underneath the, um, the, the low load building exemptions that currently exist uh, within CBs, and we would be uh, recommending be applied to greenhouses as well. Overall, though, I mean, I don't know what the threshold necessarily is, but I would say that these would apply across the board from like reasonably moderate size to large. It'd be, we, we, would, we wouldn't necessarily differentiate that. It is something we could do, but it would obviously require an awful lot more work in order to determine where those thresholds should be um, in a kind of fair and equitable manner. Um, and generally, with codes, unfortunately, um, codes are really designed to be, you know, best fit for most, not perfect fit for all. Um, the way we the way we write them, because simply within commercial buildings, etc., there's so many different options of things that could actually be done, going in a very prescriptive manner, um, in terms of overall requirements, uh, would be very difficult to do for every single industry that um, are covered by these codes. And um, the public comment that you took, or the written comment that you took in this process, is that on your website somewhere, or is that somewhere available for, for reading? Like, um, I wanted to educate myself a little bit more about the, the various different options and, and comments that you got. I. Do not know if they're on our website, but we can certainly we, we can certainly talk to the stakeholders and um, have them provided to you. 
uh, assuming that they would give us permission to do so. Well, actually, I, I think they're public comments, so we can do that anyway, but we let them know that we're going to share them with you. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a quick question. Um, but I've heard they're using kind of smart controls to maybe flatten the load demands or the load, um, you know, by having kind of alternating, you know, lights turning on and off, having sections, and also uh, maybe doing lighting off peak. Um, right? Other than just cost savings for the, you know, consumer or the grower, are there benefits um, to kind of those smart control measures and trying to kind of either flatten the load or to kind of go off peak? Yeah, you want me to take that one, Barry? Yeah, okay, on you go. <laughs> uh, uh, so so it, it depends on the rate structure, but yes, there can be benefits to, um, uh, to all rate payers. So if, um, you know, if you were on a, a rate structure where you just have a, say, 12 cents a kilowatt hour or 10 cents a kilowatt hour rate flat, and you were a grower and you installed smart controls, to avoid all the utility peaks, um, there that would provide a benefit to all customers because that's how the utilities get get charged by the regional grid operator. Um, but often um, there will be rate rate designs that pass all those benefits just onto the consumer. So. Um, so the avoidance of needing to kind of build more infrastructure, the avoidance of regional charges that are allocated based on kind of single hours of a month, um, you know, those provide um, benefits to the to the utility and then the rate payers. But um, there's rate structures and designs that are are often set up, especially for for large users, to pass those benefits just you know, most, if not all of those benefits to the customer. And so it depends a little bit on who gets those benefits, um, but certainly the utilities want that kind of controls, those controls to happen and the avoidance of those charges. So they're encouraged to kind of pass, it pass as many as they, as much as they can to that customer. I would also um, just highlight the fact that as, as I understand it for the cannabis growth, um, especially within buildings, it's a very controlled environment um, and it has reasonably tight margins. So for HVAC, et cetera, that's a large, almost constant load. So that's going to be there, you know, as long as they're growing, it's going to be there 24 uh, seven. The real controllable loads within those buildings or at least within that section of the building would definitely be the lighting. Um, and as I understand it, the lighting schedules could be as much as 18 hours on and uh, six hours off as far as to encourage growth. Um, that could certainly, not being a cultivator myself and not knowing if that just has to be cumulative or if it has to be consistent or not, um, there is the possibility, obviously, of installing controls so that you know, at times of system peak, et cetera, those lights could be turned off so that they're turned on again. But what I don't know is what that would necessarily do in terms of impact on um, like scheduling for you know, staff that have to be in the building, et cetera. Would that mean that we'd have to have like um, people in over the building overnight, et cetera? So the, the, there are obviously other concerns, et cetera, um, beyond simply uh, you know, controlling the loads as far as the, um, the, the growers are concerned. But it, all of that is definitely possible. And that is something that, um, we are kind of looking at actively within other industries is flexible load management programs, which would do similar things to that, you know, turn down the HVAC systems that would you know, reduce lighting power, et cetera, um, at times of high demand. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you uh, really for adhering to the timelines in Act 164. I think you might be <laughs> the only um, the only agency to actually do that. Um, so thank you. Um, and I, you're, you're not on our advisory committee, but I feel like we're gonna have a pretty close working relationship moving forward. Um, so, so thanks for joining us. Um, and you know, we'll be in touch as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having us.
So our next witnesses um, are from Efficiency Vermont. Um, Lauren and David, are you with us? Great. We are. We're here. Well, great. If, I don't know if you have um, some information for us to start thinking about. Um, yeah, Lauren, let me know if you, if you have trouble sharing your screen. Uh, we do. Th thank you very much for having us. Um, by way of uh, introductions, my name, and for the record, my name is David Westman. I am the Regulatory Director for Efficiency Vermont, and with us today is Lauren Morlino. She is a technical expert on um, many things related to lighting and, and indoor agriculture, and so she will be giving a technical presentation for you all about how um, we anticipate being able to support the cannabis growing uh, community um, in Vermont. Uh, I wanted to just start by uh, just applauding the department for who you just heard from for a very thorough and um, open process for collecting information and uh, soliciting feedback. We were part of that process uh, that TJ and Barry were referring to, and so we had um, a lot of engagement with them and a lot of opportunities to provide our input. And by and large, we support the proposal that, that is before you from, from the department. And so we applaud them for their, their great work there. Uh, I wanted to just give a short introduction to what Efficiency Vermont is um, before I hand it over to Lauren. Um, Efficiency Vermont is the regulated utility providing efficiency services uh, statewide across all of Vermont. Um, with the exception of um, Burlington. Uh, Burlington Electric Department um, handles the efficiency program there, uh, and VGS uh, handles the efficiency programs for its own gas customers. Uh, so Efficiency Vermont is really uh, focused on providing efficiency services for all electric customers outside of that Burlington territory and users of unregulated fuel. And um, that certainly encompasses a lot of farms um, and a lot of uh, Growers who are contemplating a transition from, uh, you know, an agricultural crop to this new cannabis crop, and so um, one of the things that we've really been thinking about is uh, what, how will some of these transitions look? How will growers be impacted by um, the either the purchase of new equipment or the requirements that are are are, are put on them by, um, you know, this new licensing requirements? Uh, so one thing that I think is just important to say is that uh, we help customers go above code. We help customers basically achieve the highest level of efficiency you know, that is cost effective to achieve. We provide um, incentives and technical support uh, as well as just generally general guidance. Um, and that can be in the case of on-site visits to prescriptive rebates, uh, meaning you just show up at the hardware store and the, and, the, and the discount is available for you either at the cash register or through a convenient online rebate form. So our real purpose here is to make it easy for Vermonters to achieve the highest level of efficiency possible, and that is how our performance is based. And so um, that's part of what we thought about in the context of how will these transitions work for farmers is how can we help them become more efficient? And I think with that uh, is probably the best transition over to Lauren, who's really going to be the technical expert and showing us how to do it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And um, thanks to the Cannabis Control Board for um, asking me to speak today. I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Um, and I just want to give you a heads up too. I have contractors, of course, coming during this time slot today. So just in case I have to take a quick 10 second call um, or if you hear um, other things happening, um, sorry about that. So um, yeah, my name is Lauren Morlino and um, I am the Emerging Technologies and Services Manager at Efficiency Vermont. Um, today I'll be covering um, who Efficiency Vermont is and Dave gave a great um, introduction, uh, why we care about cannabis energy use and then what we're currently doing to support this industry. Um, hopefully you can see my screen. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, we are um, the statewide energy efficiency utility. Our goal is to reduce the cost um, of energy for all Vermonters by helping families, businesses, and institutions understand and make better use of their energy and reduce greenhouse gases. We provide direct uh, support for Vermonters through incentives, training, and technical advice. 
Um, we also achieve market transformation through supply chain engagement and partnership with energy service providers, um, also known as um, distribution utilities or DUs. Um, and um, over the life of Efficiency Vermont, um, we've saved over $2.8 billion uh, for the state, um, 12.5 million metric tons of CO and 12.5 million metric tons of CO2. Um, that's the equivalent of 2.7 million cars on the road. Today, uh, Vermonters are 38%, um, Vermonters electric bills are 38% lower um, thanks to our work. And um, we've touched over 10,000 effic energy efficiency jobs. Um, and we have 400 businesses that participate in our efficiency excellence network. Efficiency comprises over 16% of Vermont's um, electric portfolio, delivered at half the cost of purchasing new power. Um, and our customers really consist of anyone who pays uh, an electric bill in the state of Vermont, with the exception of the city of Burlington, who has their own um, energy efficiency utility under the Burlington Electric Department. And we work closely with um, BED to uh, make sure that our services and, and incentives are seamless um, to Vermonters as much as possible. Um, so now I'll dive into uh, the work we've been doing in this emerging market, um, which we usually call controlled environment agriculture. Um, over the last several years, we've been providing the services I just mentioned to a wide variety of CEA customers, um, from small residential home growers to greenhouses of all shapes and sizes, even large commercial indoor grow rooms and processing facilities. Um, we help all types of growers, including fruits, flowers, veggies, mushrooms, herbs, and of course, cannabis. Efficiency Vermont is already leading the industry in our support to cannabis and other growers, um, despite the fact that our largest volume of customers is still to come. And um, that's a lot of you on this call. Um, and so since this is an emerging market, and um, that is my specialty at Efficiency Vermont. I've been presenting about this work for several years, and I love showing these maps demonstrating the large influx of cannabis markets, um, even just considering the last three years of legalization. Um, so black shows fully legalized recreational cannabis, um, and the lighter, lightest green shows fully illegal cannabis with medical and decriminalized um, in medium greens, respectively. So you can see as I move from um, 2019 to 2020 to 2021, there's massive um, legalization of cannabis across the US. And so utilities like us have been hearing about and preparing for this market um, while Vermont legislators have done the difficult work of planning the legal, uh, legalization logistics. Um, this next graph shows the energy use intensity of historically high users of energy by sector. Cannabis is at the bottom in red, and this shows that on a per square foot basis, cannabis businesses use more energy than any other industrial process we've ever seen. Cannabis businesses also have some of the highest energy burden, um, also known as the amount of income spent on energy costs. Um, so most of these customers are using a majority of their margins to then plug back into the business in energy costs. In states and territories where cannabis has been legalized, um, the addition of electric load associated with cannabis is significant. In Vermont, um, we've seen we have had um, very few new industries and new construction come into the state. So this marks a large um, potential opportunity. We were recently talking to Sacramento Municipal uh, Utility District in California, and to give you a sense of what they're seeing, the majority of their new construction projects in their territory are large cannabis grows. Um, this graph shows that alongside other emerging industries like electric vehicles and data centers nationally, cannabis cultivation has a similar growth rate. Um, the lighting, moisture, and HVAC required to provide the most favorable growing conditions are estimated to be equivalent of the energy required for 3 million additional cars nationally. 
And um, again, nationally, the cannabis industry spends $6 billion in energy, the same amount as all federal government buildings combined. Um, lighting load, even though it's only shown at 38% here, drives the majority of these other loads, especially air conditioning and dehumidification. If you, if you can spend more of your energy getting the light to the plants instead of energy escaping via heat um, inside your grow space, you can reduce uh, this entire energy pie. This is an aggregate of many different grow operations from about 10 years ago, and while loads vary by facility and technology type, this breakdown of energy use is generally still applicable today. Um, an efficient grow operation of medium size can easily use $20,000 in energy per month. Um, that's what we're seeing with our current customers. So um, now I'll jump into kind of what we have been doing in the space so far. Um, quickly, I'll just mention that we do have an online prescriptive uh, cash back rebate for qualified LED grow lights for residential customers. Um, we were the first in the US to offer um, this type of incentive. Uh, they get $100 off an LED grow light that qualifies for the DLC horticulture list. These products are ultimately designed for high quality commercial growing, hence the large $100 rebate. Um, we also steer customers who are growing easier plants like microgreens or vegetable starts to lower wattage and intensity lights like LED shop lights, which are incentivized at the point of purchase through Efficiency Vermont. Um, we wrote a blog po post clarifying um, which type of light you might use for which type of plant. And it was the most popular Efficiency Vermont blog post ever. So we know that lots of folks, especially since COVID-19, are growing all kinds of different plants, including cannabis at home. This graph shows uh, the lighting and cooling savings associated with replacing incumbent technology lights with LED grow lights. You can see there are significant savings um, on the wattage reduction from something like a high pressure sodium light to an LED um, that provides similar photons to the plant canopy. And you can see that there's also cooling savings associated um, due to the fact that the LEDs run less hot um, than high pressure sodium or fluorescent technologies. Um, these are some examples of the greenhouse uh, rebates that we currently offer. You'll notice that some of the rebates are prescriptive, like variable frequency drives, um, when you get a, cer a certain amount um, of dollars off, depending on the horsepower of your pump or motor. In that case, customers can determine their rebate upfront. In most cases, though, um, customers will need to call us to enroll their project with us. Um, we'll need to do an analysis to determine how much uh, the proposed project would save over the baseline technology and therefore how much of a rebate the customer would receive. Um, we've tried to include as much information as possible, like up to 50 cents per square foot for thermal and shade curtains so that customers can understand upfront the maximum incentive that they might receive. However, I'll get to this later, but um, these projects are so complicated that we really need customers to call us and provide us with um, information about their business in order to receive accurate savings and um, a rebate estimate. Note that these rebates are subject to change and um, depend on where we land for final energy code decisions. Um, Efficiency Vermont is only able to provide incentives on products and facilities that are performing above and beyond energy code baseline, as Dave mentioned. Um, and you'll notice we do have the polyethylene upgrades and thermal curtain upgrades um, in here currently. And again, that depends on where we land on the energy codes and whether those would continue. So when you call and provide us with your information, we actually create a custom greenhouse model representing um, the different systems and schedules happening in your space. For the controlled environment agriculture projects, this is crucial to getting the analysis accurate because as I mentioned in previous slides, the interactive effects between the lighting and HVAC are very important um, and significant. Uh, when you reduce lighting load, the HVAC load, watering rates, dehumidification, et cetera, is all affected. 
um, the energy model allows us to accurately report the potential energy savings to you and the state. Um, and I'll mention too, this energy model is actually um, being looked at by other states. It's extremely advanced um, and we're leading the industry here in accuracy. Um, this is an example of a very cold day in a heated greenhouse at this farm. We helped them outfit their greenhouses with controllers for heating systems, which automatically shuts off the heat when the greenhouse reaches a certain temperature. Um, this action is shown in dark blue. Uh, before the controller, the farmer, um, the farmers were needing to go into the greenhouse and manually turn the heat off themselves, demonstrated in the light blue line. Um, the greenhouse model allows us to understand what each day of the year might look like uh, while trying to maintain certain conditions in the greenhouse and also incorporating Vermont's extreme weather outside of the greenhouse. We also provide incentives and technical assistance for um, indoor grow rooms. You'll notice most of these incentives are custom. Again, that's because uh, these are some of the most complicated systems and conditions we've ever dealt with. And the energy models must, run, must be run in order for us to calculate the most accurate savings. Um, in a custom project, you will be paired with um, or customers will be paired with an energy consultant who will do in-depth modeling of the space. And just to set expectations, we will ask customers a lot of questions um, to get to that accurate savings analysis. Um, VFDs will be prescriptive. So those, again, you can calculate yourself based on the information here and what types and um, type of pumps and motors that you have. Uh, here's what a model of a grow facility might look like, um, including flower rooms, bedrooms, employee break rooms, corridors, mother rooms, offices, storage, um, trimming and processing rooms. We model the entire business to figure out um, kind of what's being used where and what different schedules are happening. So to review, uh, custom rebates are available for cannabis cultivation spaces, including greenhouses and indoor grow rooms. Um, we also provide incentives and technical support on drying. And even last year, we did a webinar in partnership with UVM Extension, Distribution Utilities, Resource Innovation Institute, and the Division of um, Vermont Division of Fire and Safety. That can be found on YouTube um, at this link. And on the last slide of this deck, uh, has a lot of resources um, I mentioned um, within the presentation um, and hopefully folks will be able to um, to access that uh, so that you can dig into our services a little bit more. Um, additionally, in processing facilities, we can meter things like concentrator machines uh, for customers to determine how much energy those are using. We can also provide support on laboratory or processing room ventilation. And finally, refrigeration for industrial process and cold storage, um, like ultra low temp freezers or walk-in coolers. So um, if you're a customer, you might be asking yourself, what do I do next or how do I get started? And um, the answer is really to call Efficiency Vermont to enroll your project. Um, in fact, we prefer that you call us early and often. Um, we cannot uh, provide uh, retroactive rebates on custom measures because they are unique to each facility. Um, we want to make sure that you're choosing a product that's going to work for you and your plant needs. And um, customers really drive this process. Uh, we're just here to help. Um, make sure that you're following up with relevant information and keep in touch regularly to ensure that you'll receive a rebate and the support that you need. Um, things that we might want to know include the location of your facility, um, equipment you're thinking of purchasing and the price or quotes that you've received, uh, schedules of lights on, lights off, HVAC on, HVAC off, watering, the number of cycles per year um, that you're growing, number of grow rooms, processing rooms, other spaces, square footage of each. Um, hours of operation, like when are you running your facility and how long? Um, can you avoid uh, certain peak times of day, for example, 5 to 9 p.m.? Um, are you working with engineers, HVAC and lighting specialists? 
uh, do you have a system design or drawing or um, photosynthetic photon flux density layouts that you can share with us? Um, I highly recommend working with engineers and specialists as these grow rooms are not easy to design um, and it makes it much easier if we have things like mechanical drawings or lighting layouts um, to work with you to make sure that um, we're giving the plants exactly um, the energy and nutrients that they need. Um, and of course, uh, you know, customer schedule availability is really important because um, we'll probably want to do site visits um, in a lot of these cases. So um, matching up our schedules is really important. Um, also, we uh, suggest that you contact your distribution utilities. Um, they will want to work with you. Um, they will want to make sure that you have the right setup um, so that you're not creating negative downstream effects like brownouts in your area. Um, you will need to make sure that they have the infrastructure set up um, for appropriate power for the size of your facility. And you may want to ask them things like, which rate will I be on? What will my demand charges be? What time of day should I try to avoid running my lights? Um, do I have enough power nearby for my proposed facility? And if not, is it possible to get three phase um, a, or a line extension to my site? Um, finally, I encourage you to participate in the public energy code conversations. Um, this is how you will determine what your, um, that your facility um, meets state requirements. And so um, I'll quickly cover an important area in the energy codes on the next slide that we worked with um, the Department of Public Service and the um, Public Utility Commission on. Um, so as was mentioned in the previous presentation, the current energy code recommendations to the Canvas Control Board include a lighting PPE of 1.9 for indoor grow spaces and 1.7 for um, greenhouse spaces. Efficiency Vermont supports the Department of Public Service and Public Utility Commission proposal. They've done a thorough and fantastic job choosing these cost effective minimum standards that will allow for both affordability and efficiency in this emerging market. Um, the highest standard, which you can see um, by this um, top bar here, um, would be the uh, DLC horticulture specification, and that requires all LED. Um, with additional uh, requirements, including but not limited to a five-year warranty and 36,000 hours of lifetime. Depending on your design, LEDs may or may not be right for your facility. Um, we provide support for customers that will be going above and beyond energy code. Our incentives will be aligned with the DLC specification. Um, and if the energy code recommendations as currently written become reality, Efficiency Vermont will be supporting the DLC specified fixtures through financial incentives for those who choose to outfit their facility with LEDs. Um, we also currently provide incentives on thermal curtains, and um, I would love to continue the conversation around the cost of um, thermal curtains. Right now, our energy model does the um, analysis uh, on each of those um, greenhouses to figure out um, which are cost effective and which are not. Um, and we're finding that the thermal curtains are extremely expensive. Um, so I'd love to continue to talk about that um, and whether it makes sense to um, require that from the outset um, or whether that's something that um, we should, you know, continue to provide cost effective incentives for. Um, Finally, I've included a list of resources here for customers to check out um, or for the Cannabis Control Board. Um, and thanks again for your time today. I'm happy to answer any questions um, about what I've covered in this presentation. And um, just generally, our, our doors are open and we're ready to hear from folks. Thank you. Any questions for uh, Lauren or David? Um, I just have one quick question. Uh, Lauren, could you say that statistic that you mentioned earlier about, you, you said the energy for growing cannabis, three million, I didn't quite catch all of the, that, that statistic. Oh, sure. Yeah, so um, let me go back to the correct slide. Um, I think it was this one. Um, so yeah, uh, 
I said that in states where cannabis has been legalized, um, the majority of their new load or um, new construction projects um, in their efficiency utilities are um, are cannabis customers. Um, uh, the lighting, moisture, and HVAC required to provide the most favorable growing conditions are estimated um, to be the equivalent of the energy required for 3 million additional cars. And that's on a national basis. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, and then I also mentioned um, that uh, the cannabis industry spends around $6 billion in energy annually, and that's about the same as the federal government's um, buildings combined. Thank you. Uh, I've got a quick follow-up mm -hmm. on that. Um, it's probably hard to isolate this, but uh, did we see an increase in load um, when Vermont legalized homegrow two years ago? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't have visibility into that um, with the the distribution utilities might. Um, yeah, I it's mean, it's, a, it's noticeable. Time. Yeah, it's noticeable definitely on like a home by home basis. I'm not sure if in aggregate um, you would see much of an uptick, um, particularly if folks are growing under the legal limit. Um, but it it is yeah it you can definitely tell um on kind of a home by home basis um especially if they're cooling um so if they're not using leds and they're using high pressure sodium um it's possible that their tents are getting so hot that they're needing to add a lot of fan power and a lot of cooling um and and that adds a significant amount of load for um for a home i would add to that um only that those are sort of theoretical load growth, and I completely agree with Lauren's assessment that um, maybe an individual home may see that kind of uptake. But um, I follow the sort of the, the system-wide um, impacts um, pretty closely. And at this point, there's no special consideration really being given for like a wide-scale growth um, due to home growing operations. You know, it's going to be very isolated to those, you know, you know, one off, you know, growers who, who choose to do that in their homes. When we think about load growth, we're thinking about penetration of, you know, like every other home installing a heat pump or an electric vehicle. So, you know, you're talking about tens of thousands of applications in those situations. Um, you know, it, and, and I do think that, you know, depending on what that home grower would decide um, would be a very localized um, event and probably not visible from like a statewide or, or even a substation level. Okay. Questions? Um, yeah, Lauren, I know you jumped on uh, during Barry and TJ's presentation to just talk about, um, you know, envelope, uh, I'm going to get all the terminology wrong, <laughs> envelope thickness, I guess, is all for lack of a better way to describe it. I didn't know if you had anything further to say there. I would imagine that there's some folks that have older greenhouses that they've run produce in that might be interested here. I know David had kind of mentioned Efficiency Vermont tries to help people get above and beyond codes or standards. So if, let's say for instance, I had a greenhouse in my backyard, it's dated, um, it wouldn't pass muster if these are the recommendations that the board goes with. Um, you know, it's still, still a good idea to give you guys a call and kind of see how we could work together, you know, so to speak on, on you know, getting to a place that, that works. Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely give us a call. You know, the, the current program really is designed for folks who have existing greenhouses with a single layer of poly that are upgrading to a double layer of poly with an infrared film. Um, and so that is kind of the cost effective option for those folks. Um, that being said, uh, you know, a lot of our customers um, aren't growing cannabis year round in those greenhouses. Um, in a lot of cases, they're season extension right now. So if you mm -hmm. were growing cannabis year round in a greenhouse, it would absolutely be, it would absolutely make sense for you to have a double layer of poly um, with some kind of anti-condensation and infrared film. Um, and so that's why we felt like that was really reasonable. Um, and as Barry mentioned as well, um, that came from other states who have already implemented that for their cannabis customers. 
Um, so yes, absolutely give us a call if you have an existing greenhouse that you need to um, outfit. Um, but I, I think it's totally reasonable to ask um, folks to use uh, double layer um, poly for uh, new construction greenhouses. Yeah, so if, so if I had a diversified operation and I'm just trying to add this to my portfolio, and maybe you're not well positioned to answer this question, but thoughts on how a double poly affects my ability to grow other crops in my greenhouse, I know tomatoes are mentioned, is it gonna you know, mess up my other operations? Oh, no, I mean, I think it would keep your heat in um, so yeah. I think, you know, it would, it would be helpful no matter what, um, particularly on those really cold days. Um, you could also end up with like more moisture in your space. Um, but again, you can always add other HVAC or um, fans um, to circulate air um, to, to avoid kind of moisture concerns. Um, I think it's a good question though um, about kind of we see a lot of existing um, buildings being proposed for kind of new cannabis operations. And so I think that's a good conversation to keep having is, um, you know, are there different requirements for barns um, that are being fit up as compared to um, new, uh, newly built um, steel buildings, for example? Um, I think it's a, it's a great conversation to have um, with the public. There's lots of folks who are um, kind of converting their their businesses. Great. La last question, and, and I hate to put the two of you on the spot, and feel free to decline answering this question. But as as mentioned in you know the last presentation, it, the decision was made to reg to regulate greenhouses as if they were a commercial product and not an agricultural product. I know typically Barry said. You know they don't have a lot of experience here. I'm wondering your thoughts, generally speaking, on um, the benefits and you know disadvantages of moving greenhouses into more of a um, from an energy perspective on on tagging them with that commercial designation. Um, I can take that, Dave, if if you'd like. Um, yeah. So I think there's. I think it is difficult. Um, greenhouses have always been exempt from code, zoning, permitting in Vermont, and in a lot of cases, it's actually really difficult to figure out where they are or how many we have even. Um, they pop up a lot. Um, and so, you know, in some ways, I think regulating them and understanding how many there there are and how much energy they use is really important. Um, that being said, it's going to be difficult for those folks who have never had to deal with energy codes to come up to speed. Um, and I think it's also a slippery slope with greenhouses because if you make if you make really intense um, regulations associated with greenhouses, you could end up moving folks inside um, into indoor spaces um, to cultivate their their cannabis, and that uses even more energy. Um, so. It really depends. Um, I think they've done a really great job um, understanding the needs of growers and, and putting a reasonable um, amount of requirements in place. Um, but that is something that we've heard from um, from cannabis growers is um, if it becomes too hard, I may just have to build an indoor grow. Um, and that, that has bigger energy implications than the greenhouse. Thanks for having David providing you space to comment as well, but don't, don't feel the need to. No, I think Lauren said it very well. I, I think that for someone who's been around the commercial um, energy codes for a while now, um, they really do go quite deep. And I think the department and the Public Utility Commission, along with the assistance from Lauren and, um, and others on their consultant team, really did a good job of understanding the needs of growers and identifying that there are parts of the commercial building energy code that really aren't applicable or shouldn't be put into place. And they made certain exceptions there. And uh, I think Barry identified a handful of those locations. So um, I, think it's, I think it's a very reasonable approach based on what, um, based on what was presented and, and what we saw in, in the draft. The, uh, the, the, you know, the thing that Lauren mentioned about the need to calling us and approaching Efficiency Vermont for a uh, you know, a custom conversion of, you know, the existing unregulated greenhouses into this new space really can't be understated. 
because um, certainly there will be some code requirements put into place for those types of applications. Um, certainly there will be new codes for in a fully indoor non-greenhouse application. Um, and they're gonna be very energy intensive and Lauren and her team will be able to run those energy models. We have, uh, as she mentioned, a best in class energy model to help people identify which technologies, uh, which lighting, which economizers, which dehumidifiers, you know, which energy equipment is gonna be best suited and where in your facility. Cause it's equally important that, you know, not every room in that, in that building or not every room in your, in your growing operation is gonna be treated the same way. And um, we saw that reflected in the energy code. And so I think that's fair. The really the, the next step for, for growers looking for that conversion is to call Lauren and her team and um, go through that custom approach to really find where the energy savings can be for them uh, that's going to be unique to their their building, their their you know their structure, all of those all of those opportunities. Um, Lauren and David, we're joined today by two of our advisory committee members from the Agency of Agriculture, and um, they're going to be working very closely with us in this space. And I'm just uh, curious if you're okay with it. If if you have any questions for our witnesses um, while while we have them here. It's Carrie and Stephanie, by the way. <laughs> I do yeah, we'll a, take questions from anyone. I, I did have a, a question, and I haven't, can you hear me okay? I think, yeah. 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 Lauren, I appreciate all the work you've put into the model, and I've had to think about this myself a little bit over time. Stephanie and I created the hemp program and have been in and around the cannabis space uh, for a while. Um, but if, if you went back one slide where you're, where you're measuring the sort of, yep, no, that was it. <laughs> the PPE output of the lights, sort of some of the research that I looked at, uh, and it was granted a year ago, I don't know if things have changed, had suggested that if you're measuring outcomes, and the outcome being the amount of cannabis produced per watt. Um, the HPS was still sort of doubling the outcomes, the production amount of the um, LEDs. So if we're going to be using twice as many watts of LED as we are of HPS, is our efficiency lost? And, and how would that affect the, the modeling that you've done? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I think um, in a lot of cases, these are not one for one replacements. Um, we see sometimes there's one LED to two high pressure sodium. Sometimes we see two LEDs to one high pressure sodium. Um, so when we do the modeling, we actually do a photosynthetic photon flux density mapping exercise. We make sure that the plant canopy is receiving the same amount of photons um, pre and post um, putting in LED. Um, and so that allows the growers to, um, you know, basically maintain the same conditions, um, regardless of how many fixtures are installed. Um, we also use this DLC specification because there are a lot of, um, I would say, lower quality LEDs out there. Um, we point to this DLC specification because they provide things like um, the PPE right on the website. They also provide um, spectral content. And so all these questions that have historically been challenges for um, growers are answered um, in a lot of these kind of high quality third party tested um, products. Um, historically, you're right. Um, the the um, watts per gram um, of high pressure sodium has been higher. Um, that's starting to change with these high quality LEDs. And the trick is really getting um, the right LED um, replacement for your high pressure sodium. And that being said, that's one of the reasons why um, we worked with the um, department to the Department of Public Service to make sure that LEDs weren't the required, you know, the minimum standard, um, because we know that a lot of growers are, are going to have trouble moving from high pressure sodium to LED. That's why we're here. And that's why we want to incentivize these higher quality LEDs. Um, 
And so, yeah, it takes a lot of work to get that right. Um, and that's one of the reasons we wanted to allow um, some high pressure sodium, double ended, you know, very efficient high pressure sodium um, in the state to begin with, um, so that people could uh, grow with what they feel comfortable with and then get incentives for going above and beyond um, that, that code requirement. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other questions? I just have a comment, um, and it's really basic. It's, can you guys hear me? I'm kind of far yes. away from the. Okay, it's okay. Um, I just think it's important to define what we mean by greenhouse. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to ask something about that. Yeah, yeah. and like, and I, I don't know that we don't have to talk about it now, but so people understand when these rules apply to specific buildings and envelopes. Is it a high tunnel? Is it a structure like a structure that cannot be taken down is permanent on the landscape. And then the other item that I was thinking, which I think you touched on a little bit, is um, diversified farm operations. And when you use that building for both farming and for cannabis cultivation, when do these codes apply? Like, is it a 50-50 split? Like, how do you um, tease that out in a landscape where many, while we want to strive for efficiency in all farming practices um, across the state, um, but when do the codes actually apply? So that's clear to those. I started to crack that can of worms, but now it's going to be a lot of fun work at all. Those are going to be doing over the course of the next. Right. When you, you start know. your hemp and your high THC cannabis right. in the same building and they all go out in the field. Well, another another caveat, and Lauren and David, if you have a comment, and Stephanie and Carrie too, I, I, I know that even in the, the BSD recs, they do signal that a greenhouse is only considered a greenhouse if it's in if it's standing for 180 days or more. So depending on your operation, depending on when you're planning to plant cannabis in that greenhouse, there we got need to figure out a lot on when these yeah. these standards do apply. Yeah. But I don't know if you the two of you have any comments to Stephanie's question or my caveat to Stephanie's comment. No, absolutely. I have the, uh, the same questions. Um, we hear that a lot from customers. Um, you know, they're integrating their existing farming practices, whether it be greens and tomatoes with their planned cannabis operations. So I think it's definitely something that, um, yeah, we should address. Um, I don't have any answers. I have similar questions. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what, and, and one more, and how this crossover is into the tax world, and whether or not there are similarities um, so that we're not developing different rules in different programs. Yeah, um, anything else for our two witnesses? Um, well, quickly, Lauren, if you wouldn't mind sending me a PDF of this presentation, I can get it on our website. Sure, yep. And um, would an email with, I, I just want to make sure that the resources that I linked are available for folks as well. So um, PDF won't have that probably, but um, yeah, happy to whatever, send. Yeah, whatever information, you think, whatever information you want me to, or you want us to throw up there, feel free to shoot it my way. We okay. can, I think we can find a way to have the PDF um, display the links at the same time. It's a, it's, it's a, we can, we can work that out. But no problem. And thank you for the offer, because that's what we were hoping to hear is, um, you know, putting this in the hands of, of, of people who are interested in these resources. And I would again, the, the next slide that Lauren had was a was a list of resources that we were hoping, um, you know, members of the community thinking about this conversion um, would think about and a lot of resources that Efficiency Vermont has put up on it on its website. And Lauren, was there anything you wanted to highlight there? Um, we have a new um, cannabis and indoor grow page uh, for rebates. Um, it's very similar to the slide I showed here um, that shows kind of what we currently cover. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to mention, you know, we've we've done some marketing um, specific to this industry, um, knowing that we'll have a lot of projects um, in the next couple of years. So um, yeah, all of this should be really relevant and helpful for folks. Um, and yeah, always, you know, feel free to call us at this number to enroll your project or just to ask questions. Um, happy to help. And thanks again for the opportunity today. Yes, th yes thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, obviously the kind of performance measures or, you know, statistics you showed us are just incredibly impressive about what you, the work you've been doing. And clearly 
we're a little bit ahead of the game on, on the cannabis, or at least you all are on, on uh, you know, it's that establishing incentives in this, in this business, which I think is always kind of a great approach. So thank you for your work. Thanks for being here today. Um, next on our agenda is public comment. Um, we're gonna do this in two phases. Uh, we're gonna start with the folks that have joined via the link. Um, and so if you'd like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hands. Once we finish with those folks, we're gonna move to the people that are on the phone. Um, so we'll start with the folks. I see some hands going up. Graham, do you wanna uh, unmute yourself? Hi folks, let me know if you can hear me. I'm having some trouble with connection today. We hear you, we hear you. Great, this is Graham Unang Strupenacht. I'm the policy director at Rural Vermont. I'm also a member of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition, which includes Rural Vermont, the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, the Vermont Growers Association, um, Northeast Organic Farmers Association of, Vermont, Association of Vermont, and Trace Vermont, as well as Justice for All. Um, I just wanna say thanks to the Department of Public Service and Efficiency Vermont for clearly what was a lot of time and effort and a lot of diligence put into this work. Um, and also a lot of assistance that was just brought to light, you know, especially for those who want to grow cannabis indoors. Um, I think, you know, what I'd like to bring up, and I think it was get, you, it started to be discussed at the end, and what I see as particularly glaring sort of a mission in the recommendations in the presentation, um, in which I'd also frame as a request for both the Department of, of uh, the Postal Department and Efficiency Vermont, um, is that everything we just heard is specifically related towards indoor growing of cannabis. Uh, you know, our coalition fully supports those who would like to participate in growing indoors, um, but we feel that Vermont Reg should encourage and facilitate and preference outdoor production for reasons related to equity, the environment, water use, land use, et cetera. Um, outdoor production should be considered agricultural as a matter of rationality, access, equity, environment, climate justice, et cetera. And structures such as greenhouses or high tunnels used for outdoor production um, should be exempt as agricultural structures. The best in class energy model for cannabis is outdoor production. And that's hands down, we feel, and we'd um, really like to see that in the recommendations that were just brought forth. Um, there was a suggestion that if, if regs go too far with greenhouses, that people might go indoors. And the other option is that people will just stay in the existing illicit economy as well. We've seen in surveys that the majority of the existing illicit economy grows outdoors. They'd like to continue growing that way. Um, if we want to see the most environmentally sound, accessible, equitable industry in Vermont, we need outdoor production. We need to protect it as agricultural. We need scale appropriate regs, including tiered licenses and production caps. Uh, so I would like to ask the Public Service Board and Efficiency Vermont and others working on energy efficiency to recognize and incorporate into their recommendations that outdoor production is the most efficient and environmentally climactically sound method of production. Ask that they support the recommendations of our coalition uh, related to agricultural use for outdoor production, including season extension with high tunnels and scale appropriate regs, including production caps. Uh, for example, our coalition recommends a maximum indoor grow license of 10,000 square foot. We're currently seeing multi-state operators investing in 80,000 square foot facilities in the state. And I think we can all recognize based on the data we've just seen that those are gonna be very costly in terms of energy, et cetera. The maximum outdoors would be 40,000. That means about a one to four ratio uh, which is about an equitable ratio based on seasonality, crop loss, et cetera. Um, you know, these plants, cannabis, does not have to displace commercially zoned land. It does not have to live in buildings. It does not have to live under lights or in intensive HVAC. That's a choice. And unfortunately, the legislature has put deep structural barriers to achieving the outcomes it states in terms of small farm access, access illicit economy coming into the daylight and in terms of energy efficiency. So we ask again that those making these recommendations specifically to differentiate between indoor and outdoor and address scale appropriate regs. We're hopeful we'll hear more from the next two guests because we know that they're members of the Climate Council Subcommittee on Ag and Ecosystems and um, Rural Vermont has specifically recommended that the Climate Council specifically pay attention to the issue of cannabis and um, back up our, um, our recommendations. Uh, I'm glad you all got in a discussion of what a greenhouse is. It's very important. I was going to go there, but I don't think I need to. Um, I think that considering the impact of plastics, you know, which Carrie can speak to well in, in thinking about some of this important as well as energy use. Um, and lastly, I think in specifically related to some of the, what was brought up, 
I have some concerns around the self-reporting, especially for operations of scale. I think smaller operations, you know, that makes sense. But when we're talking about large operations with large footprints, self-reporting becomes a different type of question. Uh, odor was brought up. Um, and I think, you know, we again, this is where outdoor and indoor could be highly varied and where zoning really comes in. Uh, we need varied ventilation requirements for outdoor production and drying. And really, the importance of seasonal... Right, we've got a I got a few other folks with their hands raised, and we, we're going to have a public comment period after our next witness again, if you want to kind of finish up then. Yep, last bit here, you know, production caps and outdoor production will limit smell without costly measures. Current zoning clearly um, pushes growth towards more people with commercial zoning versus other. And lastly, you know, rate payers, the concern about rate payers, another, it's just another reason to incentivize outdoor production and implement production caps. And that's it. Thank you yeah. all. All right. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, Graham. Um, next, I see, is that Alice with your hand raised? Alice, you can uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, so my name is Alice Stewart, and I'm a longtime member of the Thetford Energy Committee, and that is a select board appointed position, so I just wanted to clarify that I'm not speaking on behalf of the town of Thetford right now. Um, so one question I had was um, what the impact of the proposed standards are on the state's comprehensive energy plan. Um, specifically, there's a goal to reduce total energy consumption in the state by 15% by 2025 and more than one third by 2050. So is you know is cannabis cultivation going to create an increase in energy consumption even if those standards are implemented and if yes um has anyone looked at what the impact's going to be on municipalities and the targets that are imposed on them through their enhanced energy plans so in other words is this going to result in some sort of essentially burden shift for energy committees and towns to be looking at trying to increase even more efficiency, do even more fuel switching to try to offset the fact that the state's energy use went up because of a particular industry. Um, so just, I didn't know whether that's something that anybody's thought about. So I just wanted to bring that issue up. And then um, I also wanted to um, just highlight uh, the light pollution issue with greenhouses. Thetford is very fortunate to have Longwind Tomato Farm, which is a great you know, community business. And they turn off their lights at night so that it doesn't bother the neighbors. And so I just wanted to raise that issue as something to be thinking about, especially with some of the conversations that were happening about um, off-peak load and things like that, you know, thinking about some of these greenhouses might literally be in, in a neighborhood. Um, and then I wanted to ask about um, whether anybody has looked at some of the innovative programs that are be, being done in other states, like in Colorado, where they have this program that incentivizes breweries to capture their CO2 and then provide it to the cannabis cultivators, because it's a way that you know, industries that we have within Vermont can help keep lowering the carbon footprint and not just through um, some of the more traditional methods. So I'm, I'd encourage the um, board to look at those. And then also with the exemptions for smaller um, greenhouses and indoor grows, you know, has there any been thought been given to providing low or no cost loans to those smaller cultivators so that they could have energy efficient operations even though they're exempt? So that, you know, once again, we're sort of looking at this bigger picture of the state's comprehensive energy plan and the state's goals to try to reduce energy use. And, you know, how can we maximize the opportunities now to try to make those opportunities available for everybody? Thank you. Thank oh, and sorry, I forgot. I forgot one thing. Um, the idea of um, putting assessing a fee on cannabis establishments, electric bills, kind of like we have the efficiency fee for Efficiency Vermont. And so, and scaling those based on, for instance, if a facility was net zero, they wouldn't pay a fee. So the more inefficient a cannabis establishment is, the greater fee that they would pay into programs that would help increase energy efficiency for the state. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, uh, we have Tito. Tito, you can unmute yourself. Hi there. Um, so I wanted to just talk um, quickly about the CO2 enrichment and the recommendations from the first speaker. Um, it sounded as though he was recommending that um, there had to be uh, exhaust when there was CO2 enrichment. But I just want to point out there's, you know, there's so many ways to, to grow indoors. I choose to grow in a sealed room. I think that's the, um, the most efficient and safest way to grow indoors. Um, but requiring ventilation with my CO2 enrichment would completely defeat the purpose um, and also um, make it much harder for me to control the smell. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. 
And um, also, um, uh, the second speaker, um, just to clarify, lighting does have to be constant. Um, it can be on 18 hours um, a day and off six during veg, um, but that has to happen every single day. It has to come on at the exact same time and turn off at the exact same time. Uh, and then when it switches to flowering, it can be uh, 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Tito. Thank you. So anyone else who joined by the link uh, that wants to raise their hand uh, for a public comment, please do. Okay, um, we're gonna move to the, there, I see two folks or maybe just one that is joined by phone. Um, if you'd like to make a public comment, you can unmute yourself by hitting star six. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, thanks. My name is Barry, and um, I just want to talk real quick. LEDs, uh, I believe they work. Um, I may or may not have been an HPS grower for a long time, and I got my first LED through Efficient Fee Vermont, and uh, yeah, they work. As long as you get the right ones, uh, HLG, Nexlight, Fluence, Mammoth Lighting, they definitely do the job. Um, I'd like to talk real quick about the ability to serve letter as it relates to the cost of upgrades. Uh, I'm just going to touch back a few meetings to, I forget her name. Uh, she was the social equity 2.0 speaker. She was awesome. Um, the last thing she said was don't be afraid to make things up and think out of the box. Uh, she was talking about plant counts, but if we think out of the box on subjects like this, because climate change is the challenge of our society, not just our time, but our society. And you guys are right. Cannabis industry is going to be an energy intense industry like we've never seen before, right? The small growers, the people, and I come at this as a point of view from a small grower, right? We're doing it now in our basements, in our garages, in our spare bedrooms. We are already on the load. If we figure out a way to include all of the people, you know, who don't have the money and can't build a thousand square foot facility, then we're, we're including a huge influx of incredible products that will already be on the grid. Um, and you know, back to the ability to serve cost of upgrades, uh, you know, like Crest Med's gonna build a 50,000 square foot expansion. Yeah, they're gonna definitely have to do ability to serve, you know, cost of upgrades, right? So when we talk about the big facilities versus the small growers, you know, that's, that's back to the touch tone that we talked about in one of our first meetings. Um, always thinking about that small grower and how that affects everything. And this is probably, in my opinion, one of, the, one of the most important meetings you guys are having, right? How to figure out how not to add to the, the load, you know, and, and still meet the energy efficient guidelines that our state has put forward is going to be a very, very, very huge challenge. Um, once again, I appreciate your work. I really do. And uh, I really appreciate the video recording. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Any other uh, public comment? Okay. Well, I did see Billy joined. Um, Billy Coster, if you're uh, willing to jump on, and um, so you're the director of planning at the Agency of Natural Resources. You're also uh, an advisory committee member for the Cannabis Advisory Board. Um, and uh, we're happy that you're here to join us talking about kind of some of, at least an initial conversation about some of the land use and water considerations the board needs to grapple with as we think about our uh, regulations. Great, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I don't know if you're keeping a record, but for the record, I'm Billy Coster. I'm the Director of Planning for the Agency of Natural Resources. And I do have a, a brief PowerPoint to kind of run through to manage my presentation. Is it all right if I, um, share my screen yeah like that. absolutely great okay are you seeing that yeah, we see that. Okay. And is it showing as like a 
a full thing that you can read? Yeah, yeah. it's, it's okay. a full screen for us. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so just to orient folks briefly on the Agency of Natural Resources, um, we are a state agency um, charged with a broad range of environmental, environmental and natural resource uh, protection and management uh, duties. Uh, we are structured under the agency secretary, who is Julie Moore, um, and she has a, an office of uh, business staff, litigation and legal staff, um, and planning and policy folks. Uh, and I'm the head of the, the Office of Planning and Policy within her, within her office. Under the secretary are three departments, the Department of Environmental Conservation, which is the traditional environmental regulating agency and probably has the most relevance to what I'll be discussing with you all today. Uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife that manages fish and wildlife species, as well as non-game and natural heritage species and habitats in Vermont. And then the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation that manages significant amounts of state lands and focuses on uh, recreation and um, uh, yeah. forest-based uh, economies. So I'm, you know, th James, thanks for kind of framing my comments as kind of initial and high level. And I think I want to start off by saying this is a space that we as an agency are very interested in. We're very interested in supporting um, the emergence of this market and the work of the Cannabis Control Board. Um, so this is really a, a first and what I hope are many conversations with you all um, in how we can share information and, and best um, support everyone's work to make sure that this market is both successful and is grown in a way that um, is protective of Vermont's environment. Um, so I met with a number of our different regulatory programs to discuss what we anticipate being issues emerging out of uh, recreational cannabis market in Vermont. This list is not inclusive. It's not, you know, I, I know that other things will come up as we learn more about the type, scale, location, nature of facilities, but these are kind of the high points that um, folks suggested I focus on based on their experience already with kind of hemp and CBD markets, what they're hearing in other states, and what we just anticipate as being the, the, the top line issues that, that we'll want to dig into. Um, and I'll run through each one of these, but briefly, um, it's the air emissions associated with um, growing and processing cannabis, um, waste management, solid waste, wastewater, hazardous waste that may come from the process, uh, water supply for both cultivation and processing, stormwater management, um, and then I want to talk with you about some kind of observations and concerns we have about just the the overlay between different jurisdictions, given that this is traditionally um, very much an agricultural practice that is not treated as one um, under this regulatory schema and, and some of the questions and challenges that may raise for our agency and others. And then just speak to how we hope to engage with you all and, and, and the, the industry in the future to provide more and better technical assistance. And stop me at any point if you have questions or want me to slow down or speed up. Sure, thank you. Um, so from an air emissions perspective, um, there's there's four main areas that we're focused on. Um, first is that we've had a number of inquiries over the years as the hemp and CBD markets have stood up about um, whether those materials can be burnt when, uh, you know, post, post harvest. And um, the burning of those sorts of organic materials is, uh, is, is not allowed in Vermont since those are largely uh, compostable materials. Uh, they're excluded from the open, bur open burning law so, th so they can't be burned. Um, so that's just something I want to be clear about. Um, the one issue that's been really tricky for us to manage is nuisance odors. We do regulate under our air regs um, nuisance odors, and that's typically in the context of landfills and sludge applications. But we have gotten some complaints over, over the past few years from um, medicinal cannabis and CBD operations where folks have had some concerns about odor. Um, that's a very um, subjective and difficult to kind of define improved space. Um, so this is something that we need to dig into a little bit more on how we may approach this as these facilities uh, 
become more common across the landscape, but it, it is an area that is regulated and could be relevant to this industry. Um, the last, the third one is um, air pollution permits. And, you know, this is really only going to be applicable to larger drying facilities where, um, sorry, where um, there may be equipment that is um, using fossil fuels to create heat to dry and, and other traditional air emissions. And, and we have a, um, a fact sheet on all these that I can share with you at the, at the end of my presentation that has the different triggers for um, the air pollution control permits. Um, and then the last piece is um, the kind of restrictions against hydrofluorocarbons. We understand that in some processing um, techniques, hydrofluorocarbons have been used to extract cannabis and other materials from the, the, the organic material, and, and that is largely um, not permitted in Vermont at this point in time. So I'll pause quickly there, and as I said, I'll get you more information on the the specifics of the air pollution control permits and and what the triggers are for that. But those are the the anticipated issues related to air pollution and air emissions. Billy, quick question: um, I see you've got nuisance odors listed. Just because we got a question or a comment in the last public comment portion right before you joined, somebody had mentioned light pollution. I'm not sure if that's written anywhere in statute um, that's enforceable from an agency of natural resources perspective, or if that's something that would be pursued more of on the civil, you know, side of things. But I'm um, curious if, if you have experience in, you know, light pollution issues. Yep. Um, generally, that's handled either through municipal bylaws or if Act 250 is triggered, um, it would be, come under the aesthetics criteria of Act 250. Um, our agency has addressed that issue in fairly rare circumstances where light pollution may have an impact on a, like a rare threatened or endangered species or you know, some sort of habitat, necessary wildlife habitat. You know, it's, it's very uncommon, but you know, there are some instances where a, a significant light, light emitter near a, an important habitat could raise some issues, but um, it's unlikely that would be the case with, with these sorts of facilities where, they'll, where they will typically. Thank you. Okay, so moving on, um, solid waste is, you know the waste stream is probably the waste stream and the water water issues are probably the the biggest ones that we flag so far. Um, you know we anticipate there being organic waste coming from these cultivation operations after uh, the plants have been harvested. You know stems, roots, etc. Um, that sort of typical organic matter. Um, is required cannot be landfilled at this point under our um, has our solid waste rules. Um, the the expectation is that that sort of organic material will be composted or managed outside of landfills. Otherwise, um, there is a provision to landfill um, those materials if they have certain um, you know attributes like in, invasive species or diseased plants or have other um, substances that would impact the ability to compost those um, successfully. But generally speaking, um, you know, we expect that all the organics coming out of these operations are, can't go into landfills and likely will want to be composted. There are, other, there are other alternatives. They potentially could go into anaerobic digesters. There may be some potential for land application, but in all likelihood, um, you know, composting is is going to be the best option for them. And our solid waste program has been very active in trying to grow the the food residual and compost markets and and capacity in the state, and are very interested in working with you all and um, this market and integrating their waste streams into that process. So I'll move on from solid waste to wastewater. Um, again, this is somewhat speculative, but we, we expect that there will be a fair amount of liquid waste um, developed from cultivation and, and processing. We, we anticipate that likely there will be some significant indoor hydroponic uh, cultivation component to this market. Um, 
and you know if that changes these issues may be less significant but we we anticipate that that's going to be a big part of what what happens in the state um one way to treat wastewater is through a municipal system this is where you're uh within a municipal service area your drains are hooked up to pipes that go to a wastewater treatment facility these are largely and are more densely uh densely populated parts of the state, larger cities and towns. Um, the capacity of those systems are, are managed by the, the system operator. Um, and, you know, that that is something that um, growers are going to want to explore when they are looking for sites to um, operate a business to make sure that there's sufficient wastewater capacity within a municipal system to accept their their discharges. Um, the other issue that may come up with municipal systems is that of high strength waste. Um, it's very likely that some of the cultivation operations may be high in phosphorus and potentially other metals and um, constituents based on the mix of fertilizers they use that may require pretreatment before they are accepted by a municipal system. So this would require um, investments in equipment and infrastructure at that site or as part of the municipal system to, to knock down the strength of that waste before it goes into the, the municipal plant. Um, the the specific the specifics of that are really driven by kind of what's in the wastewater stream, the the specific constituents coming out of that 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 operation, and then the constraints on the system. Are there already high levels of phosphorus in the receiving waters? Are are the uh, the municipal wastewater plants operating under other sorts of constraints that um, pretreatment may be necessary to mitigate? Um, if pretreatment is required, um, that's that's done through a permit that our, our agency um, issues. I, I put the reference there. So this is again just a place where it's not an insurmountable challenge by any means. It's 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 common for um, kind of manufacturing and commercial enterprises that discharge wastewater into municipal systems to do pretreatment. It's it's pretty ubiquitous within the kind of brewery space, but just flagging this now, and this is certainly a place that we would provide a lot more assistance and guidance uh, to you all in the market as, as things move forward. Um, another strategy to manage wastewater is on site. So this is, you know, the traditional septic system model in, in some ways. This is where you don't, you're not within the, the, the service radius of a municipal system and you need to treat, treat your wastewater on your site. Um, and there's a couple of approaches there. One is um, considered indirect discharge to groundwater. And this is your traditional septic system where you pump water into a leach field or something else and it percolates through and that percolation down to groundwater filters out um, all the pollutants. For higher volume, higher strength systems that some of these may represent, um, we would jump from um, an on-site septic system to more of a underground injection control system, um, which is just a, a more advanced, more highly engineered, more highly monitored means of discharging to groundwater. Um, and those approaches are, you know, must comply with the state's groundwater protection rule and we issue permits at different scales depending on the volume, complexity and constituents associated with those discharges. Um, there may be the ability to land apply um, wastewater from these sorts of facilities. Um, that is also managed through the UIC program. Um, you know, that is not uncommon. We see kind of land application of certain wastewaters on agricultural fields. Um, that's one of those funky places where how this interfaces with agriculture is something we're going to dig, we're going to need to dig into a little bit more, but that is another alternative. Um, and then the the final kind of opportunity for wastewater management on site is what's called direct discharge. And this is effectively where you have a pipe flowing directly into a surface water, like a lake or a stream or a river. Um, this is probably the most difficult approach to pursue and requires significant treatment of that waste stream at the facility. Um, those discharges need to comply with the Vermont water quality standards and obtain um, permits from our agency, but that is certainly uh, an option as well. 
And then on the the sanitary wastewater side, this is you know what uh, an operation might use for their staff um, and visitors to use the bathroom, use a, a kitchen, et cetera. Those are all just permitted like any other business would be. So that's the wastewater side. Then the, the last waste stream that um, we see as potential for this industry is, is hazardous waste. And um, based on some of our experience with CBD, some of the solvents used to extract um, CBD does trigger the hazardous waste rules. Um, and basically, if you are a facility that has a certain volume of hazardous waste on site for your processing, there's different tiers of oversight from our agency and different tiers of permitting. Um, at the low level, it's just a notification um, approach and, a, and an openness to be inspected at, as needed. And as you go up through the, the volume and intensity of hazardous waste, the, the oversight is, is more significant. Um, and if you're generating hazardous waste, then that all needs to be um, disposed of through permitted uh, haulers to licensed facilities. Um, so again, this is an area where we can and will produce additional technical assistance guidance and work directly with the industry to kind of, you know, help them navigate this. But it's it's a it's a it's a it's something we anticipate on the processes processing side some potential during cultivation depending if there's going to be pesticide use but um, that seemed like a, a lesser likelihood based on our experience so moving on from waste to water supply um, so again this is largely a cultivation based market we anticipate there's going to be water needed to grow cannabis um, and likely some water needed to process it, depending on what the end products look like in Vermont. Um, there's different ways to get that water. Um, one is from groundwater. Um, and groundwater withdrawals need to comply with um, the state's groundwater withdrawal and permitting rule. And um, at the low end of that rule, we just need yearly, um, at, at the low volume of, of withdrawal, you know, up to 20,000 gallons a day or 20,000 gallons a day or greater, we need um, a yearly report of the, the the daily withdrawals. We need some track record of how much water is coming out at any one given location. Um, when you trip above 57,600 gallons per day, um, then a permit is required. And my understanding is that we've only issued one of these permits in Vermont so far. It was for a bottled water um, facility. Uh, this is a fairly difficult process. And I, I can't imagine that these facilities would be extracting that much water on, 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 a, on a daily basis for their cultivation needs. This is 40 gallons a minute, um, every minute of every day. So um, it's possible. And if so, then you know there is a, a, a permitting framework to protect groundwater at that level of withdrawal. But as, as I said, I, I doubt that's likely. I don't even know if they'll hit the, the 20,000 gallons a day um, trigger. Um, these volumes would be inclusive of any other groundwater needs that the facility had. So for drinking water, et cetera. So, you know, again, if, if there's a, a facility that's going to have high groundwater withdrawal needs, you know, we would want to just connect with them directly and talk through what their options are. And this will be another place where we provide more specific technical guidance catered to this industry, you know, in the coming weeks and months. Um, another source of water is from surface water. This is withdrawing from lakes, ponds, rivers, streams, etc. Um, last legislative session, the General Assembly passed Act 173, which um, charged ANR and other stakeholders to come up with um, recommendations on how best to regulate and manage surface water use. Um, that work is under, you know, with a particular focus on irrigation for agriculture. Um, that work is underway right now. We expect recommendations to come back um, in advance of the next legislative session, and I can provide you all a briefing on, on that at a later date. Um, currently, the agency maintains um, a minimum flow procedure, which basically requires that any surface withdrawal maintain certain conditions in that surface water to maintain habitat, public safety, 
and whatever recreational other values that those those waters provide. Um, and we implement that through our DEC uh, rivers program and um, those become requirements of Act 250 permits and are you know applied broadly for surface water withdrawals. And I've got a link there to that program and the, and the procedure itself. But again, this would be part of any sort of future technical assistance we develop um, for you all. Um, and then the other source of water could be from a municipal system. Again, this is where you hook up to a city or town's water supply. And again, the allocation of that water is going to be um, dictated by the, the system operator. So that's water supply. Um, another permit that that may be necessary or a place where we've got a little bit of ambiguity uh, is, is stormwater. Um, understanding that there may be some larger um, kind of warehouse scale cultivation operations. I just wanted to note that any facility generating an acre or more of new impervious surface will require an operational stormwater permit. And impervious surfaces are, you know, surfaces that water can't percolate through. So it's everything from roofs to pavement to uh, packed gravel etc so um, if you're building a new facility at this scale you're going to need to get an operational stormwater permit um, we also require uh, construction stormwater permits for um, construction activities that involve an acre or more of earth disturbance our current thinking and analysis of the law is that this wouldn't necessarily apply to cultivation of cannabis um, even though there may be some tilling and planting, it's not in the context of construction or site preparation. So we don't believe that if you're cultivating, you know, more than an acre of, of soil for, for this purpose, you would need uh, a construction stormwater permit. Uh, but that's something we're going to continue to research. And if, if anything changes on that front, we'll certainly let you all know. And then I'll just pause there to say, you know, any of the other traditional agency uh, media permits would be required if you were going to build a new facility. You know, you would need to avoid wetlands, um, you know, deal with all the kind of things you would need to deal with if you're going to build any sort of uh, business anywhere. And, you know, we can provide a full list of those permits, but those there was nothing exceptional about those as it relates to the cannabis industry. Um, so that that's basically the kind of high-end water and land use concerns that we flagged um, and i want to just take a moment to talk about some kind of questions and concerns we have around jurisdictional overlap and and as that relates to act 250. um you know as you know your act defines cannabis as a non-agricultural activity um, for the purposes of all relevant state laws um, and that's fine in the indoor context. You know, I think it, there's some, it raises some questions for us as far as like how you dispose of some of the organic waste, but I think we've got some good clarity around that. But the, the real question for us is if there's a cannabis grow in the context of a larger farm, you know, how are those boundaries drawn? If you're a 300 acre dairy farm and you've got a couple acres of cannabis, you know, and you're using the same equipment to grow everything, you're, you know, composting your um, stalks and stems from your cannabis grow with, you know, the composting of your manure and other agricultural products, you know, what kind of kind of regulatory and jurisdictional drift or murk may evolve from from those sorts of scenarios. So that's not something I've done a ton of thinking or legal research into, but I think that's a space that we'll all benefit from some clarity around going forward. Um, similarly, you know, how Act 250 may apply to these operations. Um, generally in towns without um, municipal zoning and subdivision bylaws, Act 250 is triggered for any commercial activity on a, a parcel an acre or greater. Um, so if you're having cannabis being grown on a portion of a farm, in almost all cases, farms are going to be bigger than an acre. Um, is that cannabis cultivation going to pull that farm into Act 250 or is the, the farm operation going to need to go through the exercise to kind of 
uh, shrink jurisdiction to just a cannabis um, operation, which is called um, the Stowe Highlands test, or excuse me, the Stony Brook test. And, you know, it just, it just creates complexity and questions about how and where Act 250 is going to exert jurisdiction um, over these sorts of operations and the remainders of the land that they may be on. So again, nothing specific, just a question that I think would warrant some uh, input from the Natural Resources Board who administers Act 250 and some further thinking by us all. Billy, very, very quickly, not a question, just a comment. This is one of the many things that keep me up at night is figuring out this relationship with 250 and, you know, depending on what you choose to do with your land, if it is in current use, and let's say that you aren't successful as a, uh, a, a cannabis cultivator and want to go back to cultivating whatever you were before, right. what, what does it all mean? And I think you know, whether it's working with the board or, or the Natural Resources Board or through our working group on environmental and energy issues, this has got to be one of the, the primary, you know, things yeah. that's, that's talked about and really, you know, figuring out the ambiguity of what this implies and what this means. Good. No, I'm, I'm glad you're thinking that way. And, you know, just, you know, there are good examples already in Act 250, I believe, for, you um, kind of earth extraction operations like quarries and gravel pits. Um, that's one of the few land uses where Act 250 jurisdiction um, can apply for a limited duration. Um, Act 250 jurisdiction can actually go away on a gravel pit site after the pit's been extracted and um, decommissioned. And you can go back to just having an un, um, unencumbered land again. So there, there may be, and I don't know if, I don't know if that's an Act 250 rule or if it's a, that's in statute, but that's at least there's an example of a land use that is kind of regulated by Act 250 for the the tenure of its use, and then when it reverts back to its previous condition, Act 250 potentially can go away. Um, and then the and last, starting, go ahead. At least, at least there's a starting point for trying to figure out that unique situation. Yes. And then the last thing I'll just leave you with is kind of where I started, um, that we're really committed as an agency to kind of supporting you all and, and this market. Um, we have begun discussions with our environmental assistance office around um, developing kind of a, a program for outreach and technical assistance to uh, cannabis cultivators and processors. Um, we had a very successful effort um, for breweries a number of years ago when craft beer was really blowing up in Vermont and really well-intentioned folks uh, were growing businesses to a capacity that required a whole new suite of permits that they just didn't know how to navigate. And I think we got some really positive feedback from the the, the brewing cohort on, on that outreach. So I think that's something we're very interested in replicating in this space and would you know welcome your thoughts on you know the timing of that and you know who who to kind of engage with to develop those sorts of materials and programs that's great and then, and then lastly just my contact info um right so that was a and i'll stop sharing right now but um how do i do that so that was a pretty high level presentation. Um, I hope, I apologize if that didn't hit the kind of level of detail you're hoping for, but at this initial conversation, I thought I'd just keep it at that scale. And there's a lot of detail that underpins what I presented. So certainly, you know, if there's more you're looking for, we, we can get that to you. No, it's, it's really helpful, especially just in these kind of early fact-finding orientation uh, meetings that we're doing. Of course, you're going to be on our advisory council and going to be, you know, heavily involved in, in helping us develop a licensing structure and kind of a permitting process. So uh, we appreciate you, you joining us today to kind of help us understand these initial uh, considerations. Uh, are there any questions um, for Billy? I actually don't have any. Thank you. I appreciate the education. Um, Billy, I have a question for you. Um, we, we saw a recommendation earlier from the um, Public Service Department about getting pre-approval from the utilities that be used um, around when, you know, before 
kind of hooking up a new cultivation site because of the kind of energy concerns that, that might arise um, and the capacity. You know, I see uh, both from the kind of wastewater perspective and the water supply that there might be capacity concerns there. Um, you know, is this something, you know, at least for the larger cultivators that you would, we should consider thinking about a kind of pre-approval um, from the municipalities uh, if they're not going to do the, if they're going to, you know, not engage with the on-site, um, kind of on-site discharge or some other concern. Absolutely. I think, you know, getting an early read from the municipal services around capacity is is important. Um, I think those systems have a pretty good idea of, of what capacity they, they do have to allocate. So, um, you know, it's not like it could go disappear quickly. So I think, you know, just getting some early indication around water supply and wastewater capacity um, is, is a great suggestion. Um, and I think for these larger operations, you know, we as an agency would certainly be happy to provide some kind of pre-permitting scoping review to kind of just sit down with them and say, here is, you know, the the checklist of things that we would be looking for as a, as a regulator um you know the the range of permits the range of issues you know what are you proposing let's talk through it and we can give you as much guidance and technical assistance as we can on your kind of concept plan to make sure that you're successful when you ultimately do f move forward with permits so um we could roll the the water wastewater capacity stuff into those conversations so that's certainly you know that's something we do now for large developments you know folks will come and sit down with with my office to say hey i want to do this thing at this place you know this is what we're thinking what are we missing what do we need to do and that's that's a service we pr provide regularly so i think uh, you know that would be something we'd be happy to do for you know anyone in this market but especially the the larger folks that might have the, the bigger issues yeah are you fully staffed up at ANR to kind of bring on this new industry and the kind of concerns that they, you know, if you're getting your inbox flooded with these folks that want to come and I can talk to you about these. Are you able to handle that? Uh, I think we will be. Um, you know, we are trying to bring on some capacity in response to the federal ARPA funding that is coming through the state because that's going to just generate a lot of development, a lot of permitting. So I think in some of these key programs that I talked about today, we are hoping to grow some capacity. And we've also um, kind of reorganized the focus of the Environmental Assistance Office recently, I think specifically to create space for this kind of sector focused outreach. So my hope is that within that group, especially, there will be um, people or at least a person that could really run point for the industry. Yeah. That's great. Any other questions at this time? So I got questions, Billy, but I know you don't have the answers right now, so we'll, we'll talk more about this. The thing kind of starts to stumble downhill. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, feel free to in engage with me kind of formally like this, or if you ever just have questions, you know, feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call. If I don't have the answer, I can connect you with the people who hopefully do. Great. Thank you very much, Billy. Thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Um, we have next on our agenda another session of public comment. Um, we're going to follow the same kind of model where the folks who join via the link, please just raise your virtual hand if you have a comment. Um, and then after we get through um, those comments, we'll move to anyone who's joined us by phone. So if you have a comment um, on anything that you've heard or anything in general, please raise your virtual hands. Graham, we'll start with you. Hey folks, this is Graham again, Policy Director at Rural Vermont. Um, thank you, Billy, for that presentation. I think the only thing I really want to mention here is that there's been a number of co potential conversations about the potential for conflicts between diversified uses of a farm or a farm diversifying into cannabis production or a cannabis producer maybe you know wanted to move into agricultural production and potential jurisdictional overlap, et cetera. And I think it should just be recognized that from our perspective, the likelihood of this is, is very low given the zoning. How many farms are currently established on commercially zoned land? 
how many commercially zoned land pieces are appropriate for outdoor production? Uh, you know, I think, I think that answers a lot of the question right there. There are certainly areas without zoning, and I think that's where we'll see most of this issue. But otherwise, we, unless you're operating a very large farm with particular zoning already established for a retail store or something, like you're, there's very few farms that have commercial zoning uh, and will be able to even produce it all. And that's part of our point is that outdoor production is more or less made illegal in, in based on how this law is, is, is written. And we don't feel that there's a sufficient solution. We need outdoor to be protected as ag, as we've said. And lastly, um, I just know that Billy was mentioning, you know, are there people he should talk to? And I would just recommend, Billy, that you turn to the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition, the Vermont Growers Association, Trace Vermont, um, Rural Vermont, NOFA Vermont, farming organizations. Um, sometimes it feels like we are speaking into a vacuum, but we are here and we definitely claim expertise on different aspects of this issue. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, Graham. Thank you. Uh, next on my list, I see Alyssa Yant. Alyssa, feel free to unmute yourself and provide comment. Can everyone hear me? We can hear you. Yep. Okay, so I wanted to thank Billy for his presentation and I wanted to bring up something about the solid waste portion of that. So there is a way to recycle some of the crops rather than composting all of them. So for example, um, the stocks contain material that can be used to create clothing, biodegradable plastic bags, paper, butter, oils, teas, lotions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this can not only reduce crop waste, but it can also promote other types of cannabis businesses as well. So to take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tito, do you have a comment for us? Uh, I do, and I, I second what Alyssa Yance just said too. Um, I feel like I need to uh, be a voice for sustainable indoor growing. Um, it is true that yeah, maybe some people may be growing uh, hydro uh, indoors, and and um, but um, there are a lot of really really great sustainable ways to grow indoors. So I just I just uh, don't want indoor growing altogether to be very demonized. Um, if you you know for example uh, by using uh, no-till techniques, uh, you reuse your soil using a uh, blue mat watering system, for example. There actually is no water runoff uh, if you use it properly. Um, and, uh, and absolutely every single part of the plant can be reused. Um, so uh, I just want to continue being that voice for sustainable indoor growing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else who's joined by the link want to uh, make a comment, please just raise your virtual hand and we'll call on you. And anyone who's joined by the phone, um, you can unmute yourself by hitting star six. All right, um, we're going to break for lunch. Um, we're going to be back at one o'clock uh, to hear from Ryan Patch. Uh, around some additional water and land use considerations. So Kyle, could you please pause the recording? As long as I don't trip. Okay, um, we're back. It's one o'clock. This is the uh, Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Um, and our next presenter is Ryan Patch, the Deputy Director of Water Quality at the Agency of Agriculture. And um, Ryan, I don't, are you with us? I see you. Yes, I am. Great. Well, can um, you hear me? We can hear you. If you'd like to video, that's fine. If not, don't worry about it. Um, but um, yeah, you're here to talk to us, kind of continue the conversation from an agriculture, agency of agricultural perspective around some of the land and water use considerations that the board should have kind of at a very high level as we start to move into our kind of regulations and uh, considerations for um, cannabis cultivation. Sure, absolutely. Um, for the record, Ryan Patch, uh, the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. Um, I would like to turn on my camera. However, it is non-functioning at this time. So um, you'll have to, to uh, make do with the slides uh, I'm about to share, um, if that's all right with the uh, board. Sure, please. The slides up. Great. Please do. 
Okay. Uh, are you seeing a uh, slide deck? Yeah, we yeah. see that. Yep. Excellent. Great. <clears throat> um, well, I was able to um, watch uh, Billy Coster's uh, presentation and uh, would echo his uh, introductory remarks about um, you know, a bit of, I don't know, uncertainty or not fully, you know, understanding how, um, you know, the, the laws pass uh, reconciles with, uh, you know, farming. Um, what I'm here today to do is to, you know, first just I'm going to attempt to provide a, uh, you know, brief overview of the, you know, environmental status of agriculture through the lens of water quality. Uh, in the state and what uh, current programming is seeking to achieve. What I will then move into uh, is uh, perhaps of, of more relevant interest to the board, which is uh, the structure of the required agricultural practices, what it g governs, how it regulates in some specifics uh, of how you know, farms uh, move through uh, that rule and what sections of agriculture um, it, it touches. Um, you know, when a, a farm is farming, as we'll discuss, uh, many of the programs and, and permits that uh, uh, Billy Coster shared uh, don't apply uh, to farming as they're regulated through the RAPs. That being said, there is a section at the end where um, there absolutely is uh, oversight for farming um, from ANR and, and other um, agencies for particular uh, farm actions, um, which I'll try to summarize at the end of the presentation. Uh, but just to orient uh, the board uh, to um, agriculture and working landscape, uh, state of Vermont has 94% of its land base covered by uh, natural and working lands, 73% forested, 12% agriculture, only about 2% of the state's land base is uh, covered by uh, development. Um, that being said, there are still water quality challenges across the state. Um, on the left, you'll see a map of uh, impaired uh, water bodies. Not all of those are impaired from agriculture, of course, um, but certainly many of them have large contributions from uh, the agricultural landscape, which can manifest in uh, eutrophication and harmful algal blooms, uh, as evidenced in the right-hand photo uh, from the Memphis Magog uh, watershed. Um, I will drill into the Lake Champlain Basin um, very briefly, as this has been the, the driving force for uh, agricultural environmental management uh, in Vermont. Uh, Lake Champlain Basin has a very robust monitoring set in lake monitoring that goes back to the 1990s, uh, so over 30 years of monitoring. And what we see from that is that uh, in many segments, water quality standards are exceeded, uh, and in some cases, the trend line is increasing. Uh, and as such, um, you know, when we look into the uh, adoption of a total maximum daily load for phosphorus for Lake Champlain. That is the pollutant of uh, concern as it comes to uh, that monitoring that I just showed you. Uh, modeling from EPA and TetraCheck showed that uh, agriculture was the largest single source of the uh, contribution of phosphorus to Lake Champlain. Um, two areas within agriculture were identified for reduction, uh, both point source management and non-point source, the landscape. Um, with which the RAPs are structured to um, disallow or not allow discharges from farms in the state, as well as regulating uh, non-point source um, activities on farms or farming management on farms to ensure uh, non-point source runoff uh, will meet water quality standards. Um, so here's just um, a breakdown of the loading and the reductions uh, that would be required over this 20-year total maximum daily load for phosphorus. Uh, and when you, you know, 41% of the contribution coming from agriculture uh, and a significant reduction coming from the agricultural sector as well, over 67% of the reduction uh, to come from uh, changes in agricultural land management. And we'll talk about those strategies. Uh, the agency, uh, in collaboration with, you know, DEC, uh, worked to put together um, the agricultural implementation plan, which touches uh, many different areas of farm management. Uh, both education outreach, technical and financial assistance, as well as regulatory through inspection and enforcement. The uh, reference for the required ag practices, uh, definition of farming as used by the RAP, uh, and many of the programs that are used to implement um, that program, as well as inspection and enforcement standards, 
are included in Title VI, um, Chapter 215. And from that, the agency uh, of ag promulgated the required agricultural practices rule, which I'll uh, dive into in about three or four slides or so. Um, but this RAP rule uh, was a large part of the first phase of implementation efforts that the state would undertake uh, to meet those uh, reduction requirements established in the TMDL uh, and provide a, provided a large part of the uh, reasonable assurances that the state would meet those reductions. Uh, so what I'm going to share now is just a bit of an update of how implementation has been going. Uh, this is a letter from EPA to Secretary Moore and Secretary Tebbets, um, you know, saying that, you know, again, it's not just agriculture, it's all land use sectors, um, but the state has successfully met the phase one uh, implementation uh, milestones, which is good news. Um, brief overview of the uh, programs that the Agency of Agriculture implements to address agricultural non-point source uh, pollution that prevent discharges from farms. As I just said, it's a, a bit of a three-legged stool. Education outreach is a very important component, as well as providing technical and financial assistance uh, to incentivize and encourage farmers to uh, adopt uh, practices uh, and uh, increase their adoption of those practices and improve water quality as well as uh, a robust inspection and enforcement program uh, for which uh, the Clean Water Fund provided additional funding to do so. Um, over 500 or so inspections a year of farms are conducted by um, the Agency of Agriculture Water Quality Division. Um, the uh, documentation of cleanup work and the modeling of that um, is uh, reported by Agency of Ag to DEC, and this is the uh, Clean Water Initiative Report uh, from 2020, which catalogs the reductions agriculture has contributed since uh, 2016 in relative uh, comparison to um, other lands. We anticipate this balance to shift as, as other lands uh, get up to speed. Uh, as I'll be sharing, uh, there's a, a long history of agricultural implementation uh, in the state to work towards uh, non-point source management and improvement. Uh, we realize these reductions in part from regulatory programs state funding programs and our partnership with uh, federal funding programs, all three of them coming together uh, to support agricultural adoption of uh, water quality practices. Uh, a cost effectiveness analysis in this phosphorus space shows that agricultural field and pasture practices are uh, by far the most cost effective on a kilogram uh, basis per unit of, of production. Uh, but there's still a long way to go. And um, that's a whole other presentation of um, how we're working to get to 2038, um, but about 13% of total reductions uh, reported uh, to date. Um, and please feel free to interrupt me at any time with questions or uh, clarifying uh, thoughts uh, folks may have, um, but that was just a brief overview of uh, the history of um, you know, water quality and, and where um, REPs uh, are at uh, today. So what I'm going to dig into now is a, is a structure of the RAPs, um, you know, what they regulate and, and how they regulate that. Um, what you'll see here is just a, a catalog of the history of developments in the water quality space going back to the 1972 Clean Water Act. Uh, you'll notice a, a phosphorus standard for Lake Champlain was established in 93 and the first TMDL adopted in 2002. Um, the required agricultural practices, RAPs, uh, were renamed uh, from the AAPs, the accepted ag practices. Uh, and there was a bit of a misnomer uh, out there that the AAPs uh, were, you know, voluntary and not required. Uh, most everyone knew, you know, the winter manure spreading ban. You can't spread manure uh, between December 15th and April 1st. Um, but there were many other standards that were promulgated and enforceable. Uh, beginning in 1995. Those AAPs were amended in 2006, renamed and amended in 2016, a further amendment for tile drainage in 2018, and we are uh, about to engage in uh, rulemaking for technical service uh, provider uh, certification uh, in this year, 2021. Um, you have Act 164, uh, we have Act 64 of 2015, uh, which uh, many call Vermont's Clean Water Act, uh, which provided uh, the funding, uh, authority, and, and requirements that the agency uh, amend the RAPs, not only AAPs, not only to call them the RAPs, but to include uh, a number of different uh, requirements from a new small farm certification program, standards on nutrient storage, soil health requirements, 
uh, increased buffer zones, livestock exclusion from surface waters, and uh, nutrient management planning uh, requirements. So here's just a bit of the breakdown between uh, point and non-point source uh, regulation of agriculture in the state of Vermont. Uh, we have a, a memorandum, memorandum of understanding with the Agency of Natural Resources, and we uh, partner on farm uh, inspection and enforcement. Uh, when it's a non-point source, it's with the Agency of Agriculture, and if it's a point source, it goes to the Agency of Natural Resources, and we coordinate um, in that space. So what are uh, the required agricultural practices? Um, you may glean from kind of the introductory framework that it's very much about the agricultural non-point source pollution uh, reduction, uh, reducing nutrient losses from fields, uh, making sure they don't get to surface waters, make sure they don't cross property boundaries. However, the RAPs do establish other uh, minimum standards in areas that relate to farm uh, construction and management. So minimum construction and siting requirements for farm structures and floodways, floodplains, river corridors, and, and flood hazard areas. Farming, um, you know, the, the definition in the RAPs is uh, essentially word for, for word from, uh, you know, the, 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 the definition of farming as used in Act 250 section of statute, but it's a, a broad uh, definition that covers a number of different activities on a farm. Uh, it means, you know, the cultivation or other use of land for growing food and fiber, you know, raising and managing livestock, greenhouses, production of maple syrup, uh, the storage and preparation and sale of ag products on a farm when they're principally produced on a farm, on-site storage and preparation of sale, uh, you know, production of sale or, uh, of, of um, fuel or power, you know, to biofuels. Um, raising and management of horses as well uh, fall under that definition of farming. We regulate waste and agricultural waste. So when a waste stream is generated on, on a farm related to you know, farming, um, that material has uh, disposal standards, uh, generally stacking setback requirements, uh, spreading setbacks from uh, surface waters, uh, and is, you know, comprehensive of, uh, you know, runoff from uh, feed bunks on a farm, uh, manure and ag waste that a far, uh, cow may produce, uh, and, and other uh, waste that may be generated uh, from the farming operation. The REPs establish what is a, a jurisdictional farm. Um, so it's not anyone that has a vegetable garden, uh, backyard vegetable uh, operations are uh, not regulated by the RAPs until they reach a certain scale. Um, the threshold criteria are established in section, th section 3.1. Uh, the largest uh, things that would tip someone into the RAP regulation is, you know, you operate four or more acres used for farming, or you earn uh, an annual gross income of $2,000 or more from the sale of ag products on an annual basis. Uh, and, you know, the, we also have, um, this is the, the, RAP is a minimum threshold criteria. As farms increase in size, they increase in permit oversight and uh, regular inspection cycle. Um, that's uh, established uh, by law, and we implement that um, through a number of different permits in addition to the RAPs. Um, so RAPs apply to all, you know, all farming operations, uh, but there are also uh, an increasing um, standards for certified small farm operations, those small farms that are larger in scale, generally 50 dairy cows or 50 or more acres of uh, land used for the cultivation of annual crop land. And then we have uh, general permits for medium farms and individual permits for large farms in the state. The RAPs um, govern a, a number of different activities on a farm. Uh, you can read the list here. Uh, I will paste in the chat, or I guess you'll also see it on the last slide, a link to our website where you can read uh, the full rule. Um, but there's a number of different activities that are regulated in the RAPs from how and where to confine feed, fence, and water livestock, how to store and handle ag waste, um, how to, you know, the, the preparation, tillage, fertilization, planting, protection, irrigation, or harvesting of crops, 
uh, the zoning or the construction siting uh, for uh, farm structures, roads, and other associated infrastructure, um, as well as, you know, the management of livestock mortality crews on the farm. So there are standards, as we'll see, for a number of these activities enumerated in the rule. Um, there are sub-jurisdictional operations, uh, those that are engaged in growing uh, food or crops, but uh, do not meet the threshold criteria of the RAPs. We call those non-RAP operations. Um, and those would be able to be regulated by uh, a municipality. Um, there is a general exemption uh, in uh, Title 24 uh, from, for farming from uh, the, the regulation and application of municipal bylaws. Uh, and so we'll talk about that a bit uh, in um, uh, 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 Section 9 of, of the RAPs uh, when we get there. Uh, but that's a, an area of... Um, oversight that the agency uh, has authority over for those that meet um, the, the, the threshold criteria of being a farm. So here, and I will not trust, I will not be walking through each one of these sections, uh, nor all of the section six um, standards, but I wanted as an introduction, uh, you know, for the, the, the board and those, um, you know, participating in the process, just to understand that there, there are many different um, sections of the RAPs that provide um, specific requirements for farms, um, a lot of specific uh, definitions, uh, details about uh, in section three, uh, the you know, applicability and threshold criteria of the RAPs, um, standards for small farm certification, uh, training requirements for farms, uh, standards for the exclusion of livestock from waters of the state, groundwater quality and groundwater investigations that the agency of ag conducts for farming operations uh, requirements for the construction of farm structures both in existing production areas and new production areas custom manure applicators site-specific on-farm conservation practices that may be required uh, if the farm uh, is having um, a deleterious impact on waters even if they're following the rules uh, standards for subsurface tile drainage uh, as well as what we'll touch on um, some in Appendix A uh, variance processes that the agency uh, oversees as it relates to the construction of farm structures, uh, and then uh, the roles of other uh, state agencies. And that will be, you know, while there's a number of exemptions for farming from many other um, titles, uh, Vermont uh, statutes, there are those that do apply to farms. <clears throat> um, what may be of interest to the board, um, and I've just pulled out, I think, two examples from Section 6. These are the real operational standards uh, that farms need to follow in Section 6, and that's 6.01 through 6.10, uh, the prohibition of discharges to nutrient management planning requirements, uh, where the application or cultivation of cover crops are required on particular fields, uh, manure spreading standards, uh, composting requirements, uh, as well as, you know, uh, requirements for stabilization of uh, banks of surface waters. Um, so what I'm just going to do here is just dig into, I think, uh, two just examples of uh, what the rules say. Uh, what you see here is an example of a production area or a waste storage facility that are creating a, a discharge of waste uh, directly to uh, either a conveyance or a surface water, uh, and this is prohibited uh, under the RAPs. Um, so all waste need to be appropriately stored and cannot run off directly into a surface water um, without a permit from the, the Secretary of Natural Resources. Um, so, yep, 6.01 discharges is kind of foundation of the RAPs, um, whereas a, a, a CAFO permit, um, you know, for uh, under um, a CAFO permit, which is not what um, the REPs deal with or the MFO or LFO permits. You know, it could be a, a permit to discharge under certain conditions. The REPs prohibit uh, any of these uh, discharges of waste to surface waters. Um, just another example of uh, some specific requirements within um, the REPs, um, you know, uh, manure uh, stacking and ag waste stacking. Um, this could apply to a, a compost um, uh, uh, being managed on a farm, uh, but, you know, we establish uh, specific minimum setbacks uh, that a farm uh, 
uh, it needs to follow for stacking manure or other agricultural waste that back some surface water, ditches, private water supplies, as well as property boundaries. Uh, and that's something that um, the agency you know, is enforceable and the agency uh, engages with farms on ensuring they have uh, the best, you know, using the best available sites to stack and store manure appropriately. Um, another important standard for farms, which kind of um, informs uh, the baseline of uh, cropland management is uh, vegetative buffer zones and required manure spreading setbacks. Um, so all surface waters in the state uh, need to have a 25 foot manure spreading setback. And if they're an annual cropland or cultivated cropland, not hay, uh, they require a 25 foot vegetated buffer zone. Uh, all ditches in the state are required to have a 10 foot setback uh, for both manure spreading as well as, um, uh, as, well as um, a vegetated um, buffer zone there. <laughs> And there's other specific buffer zone requirements as well um, for some other, you know, wells and um, and the like. I mean, here's just a diagram of how uh, a field could be cultivated between a surface water and ditch and the setbacks of far, a farm would need to follow. Um, within uh, the appendix, um, this is related to section nine, the construction of uh, structures on a farm. Uh, you know, there's a process for obtaining a variance to uh, municipal setback. The agency tries to meet municipal setbacks wherever possible. Um, however, uh, folks may be aware, you know, farming in Vermont, many of these locations long, you know, predates many of the modern zoning requirements that the state has. And so you'll find, um, you know, barns and in, in animal operations and locations that uh, there are standards and requirements that they improve uh, their um, management of a particular, uh, you know, barnyard as an example, um, but they can't meet the setbacks for, um, you know, either those established in the RAPs for setbacks from uh, a, a surface water or the municipal setbacks. And so there's a variance process that the agency oversees um, to ensure those conservation practices can be uh, installed uh, where necessary. Uh, we establish specific criteria uh, within Appendix A um, that a farm needs to demonstrate before um, the secretary will issue uh, the variance. Um, and one example is a, a waste storage uh, facility. Here's a diagram here um, that you know needs to be installed to collect waste to prevent a discharge, but there's no uh, space available on the farm or, or the land base. Um, and this is the best available site on the farm and will enable uh, the collection and storage of uh, ag waste and runoff from that farm so it doesn't get to a surface water. Uh, this is obviously mentioned you're uh, trying. Um, so uh, kind of just wrapping up through the, the quick run through, um, you know, the RAPs, um, while there are a, a number of, um, you know, exemptions for uh, farming for those farms that are regulated by the RAPs, um, you know, as uh, Billy's presentation pointed out, um, you know, ground groundwater withdrawal, uh, you know, reporting and permitting requirements. Um, farms and those that are engaged in farming under the RAPs are uh, exempted from that groundwater withdrawal, both reporting and um, permitting uh, requirement. Just as an example, um, you know, other examples that were talked about were the Act 250 uh, exemption for uh, farming, and I've touched briefly on uh, the. Um, uh, the, um, you know, exemption for, uh, you know, municipal bylaws. Um, <clears throat> so within this um, appendix or advisory section of the REP, as we try to outline, well, there are, there are areas uh, of law that uh, affect uh, farm operations from wetlands, right? You can't convert uh, a non-farmed area to cropland without a permit from DEC. Um, you need a construction stormwater permit for new farm structures. If you're gonna do surface water withdrawals above the minimus levels, uh, you'll need a permit from DEC to do that. Uh, there's stream alteration permit requirements that a farm may need to have. Um, and of course, flood hazard area and river corridor uh, permits would apply for certain farm structures uh, that may need to be constructed uh, in those areas. Um, yeah, so that is a, a brief overview of um, 
RAPs, happy to engage and uh, answer uh, questions that the, the board may have. Uh, but you can you know, learn more uh, about either water quality programming or the RAP specifically there. Uh, and my um, contact information is um, uh, below that. So uh, thanks, happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Uh, that was very helpful. Any questions for Ryan? Yeah, but I've asked a lot of questions. Go ahead. I'm still trying to figure out that. Yeah, so Brian, thanks again. And I think just a, a point of clarification for everybody on the phone, Brian went over parts of the RIPs that will apply to a cannabis cultivation business, um, regardless of the commercial versus agricultural designation. And Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's section six, eight, and and 12 of the required agricultural practices. I was curious, um, you know, we've been we've been hearing a lot about this ag versus commercial designation. Are you aware in, in your role as deputy, um, you know, director of water quality, is there any other kind of commercial businesses that are subject to the RAPs or is this kind of uncharted water for not only the board, but for you and for a &R? Um, Yeah, so um, to, I, I'm the first uh, point of information you shared. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to see if I understand um, the, the point you made there. Um, my so hemp, right? Uh, cultivation, you know, falls under farming and, and the RAPs. Um, as I read um, the uh, Act 164 of 2020 and the cultivation of cannabis, um, you know, it, it says that a cannabis established establishment should not be regulated as farming under the RAPs, and so. I don't believe um, the RAPs would apply uh, to those operations. There may be farms uh, in the state that are existing farming operations uh, that may move to, to cultivate uh, cannabis as defined um, in, in, in the law. Um, and I, I don't know how that uh, overlap uh, would apply. Um, there are sometimes commercial areas on a farm, um, but I, I don't believe the RAPs would apply to those operations. Yeah, I thought I remembered there is explicit language in 164 that says they're still subject to certain sections, but uh, I don't have that statute in front of me. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, I'm still, I'm curious, um, and I know I'm opening a, a black box, uh, and I don't have my thoughts fully formed, but um, wondering just general thoughts on, you know, how outdoor grow operations kind of maneuver through through this puzzle, um, considering it's not an agricultural crop. Like what what, what sure. pressure points, what bottlenecks do you do you foresee? I know I'm sure you've been tracking some of this, but Carrie Carrie's also um, itching. I can tell that. No, <laughs> not itching. <laughs> Just yeah, kind of like her, like that. Uh, Ryan, I'm in the room, this is Carrie, so feel free to answer the question, but also Steph and I are here if you want to phone a friend. <laughs> I'll be happy to uh, uh, turn it over to you folks uh, to provide uh, comments in this space. Uh, I will just say, um, you know, I have experience with uh, implementing uh, the RAPs on farms and understand that there are a lot of uh, exemptions and allowances for those operations that our farms and our farming. Uh, and when an existing agricultural operation uh, may choose to engage in the cultivation of cannabis as, as defined in the bill, while some of those sections of the RAPs may apply, I, I don't think it's going to be administered by the agency of ag. And further, there are a lot of those um, exemptions and uh, you know, limited liability or permits they don't have to get that uh, maybe that section of the farm may have to get or they'd have to be aware of uh, that their existing, you know, farming operation uh, may lose some of those um, exemptions. So there, there's a lot there. Uh, we've talked about a few, uh, and Billy did as well, Act 250, uh, stormwater exemption, you know, groundwater withdrawals, the municipal bylaws, um, you know, uh, yeah, uh, wetland exemption, um, you know, stream flow alterations. So there, there's, there's a lot, um, you know, nuisance suits perhaps, um, so there's a lot there that uh, a firm would need to be aware of, and I, I don't <coughs> know how um, that would, I, I don't understand fully how that would be uh, integrated. 
Um, so I'll, I'll turn over to Carrie and um, uh, Stephanie um, to provide any additional uh, revision or, or feedback um, <laughs> in addition to what I've shared. Yeah, thanks. Well, quick, quickly, Carrie. Thank you, thank you, Ryan. I guess I'm just trying to also get a better, better understanding of how the puzzle is going to work together, recognizing that you know um, there's a little bit of ambiguity, I guess. Carrie, no, I, uh, Ryan, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I think the the reverse of Kyle's question is sort of more important, and I think better to hear coming from you. And that's sort of what are the unintended consequences of or implications of designating sort of this agronomic practice of growing cannabis um, as not being agriculture. Yeah, that's the question I was trying to get at. Thank you for, for wording it perhaps a little bit, you know, better than I did here. Sure. Boy. Um, yeah, there's um, <laughs> a lot that could change for um, you know an existing you know farming you know, operation. Um, you know, what do you do with the waste? Um, you know, do you need a NIFTES permit? Uh, do you need a direct discharge permit? Um, you know, if it's a farm operation, you know, crop residue can be incorporated and and composted on the farm. Um, are you now going to need to go to? Is a farm now going to need to go to? and are to get those applicable permits for this, this non-farm uh, cultivation. Uh, Billy Coster raised the question around Act 250. Uh, I don't have any more of an answer than other than just it's a, an open question uh, as he, um, you know, uh, phrased it. Um, you know, nuisance suits, uh, there's, you know, limited liability for farming operations for existing ongoing farms. Uh, you know, would you lose that designation? Uh, would you be more uh, open to, um, you know, nuisance suits from your neighbors. Um, you know, I talked about groundwater withdrawals. If you're going to irrigate, are you now going to need a separate you know, well or permit for that outdoor cultivated area? Uh, boy, um, you know, the, the tractor question, right? There's AOT allowances for, uh, you know, tractors and, and uh, trucks and that's for farms and this isn't farming. So you have to buy all new equipment to do that. I, I can't answer that. I don't know. Um, and, and, you know, fire building electricity codes for, for barns, you know, would that apply to a, a hoop house um, because it's not farming? Um, you know, I, I, I can't answer that question. I, 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 don't, I don't know, but I think there's a lot of things that a farming operation um, uh, deals with through the RAP and the siting and zoning and, and you know, best practices that the, the agency um, you know, provides that that oversight, and when um, that framework is not, uh, you know, for an existing farm, it, it would really there would need to be a lot of education as to how uh, particular permits may apply to that section of their their operation uh, if they were to cultivate cannabis, and and that you know farming uh, as used throughout the the, the statutes wouldn't apply. Um, so I think there would be a lot they'd have to become aware of um, for that portion of their operation. <laughs> Like uh, Brian, I was just, Steph and I were, are you still allowed to use off-road diesel is one of the questions that would need to be answered. Um, some of the questions that came up when we were giving testimony on, um, S, hearing testimony on S-102, and that's about farms um, accepting food scraps, and are they a farm or are they a solid waste facility? Um, one of the issues came up that uh, on a posted road, a, in the, a dirt road in the spring, um, trucks are allowed to deliver ag commodities, but they're not allowed to, if it wasn't a farm, then driving those food scraps up, uh, across that road would not be considered legal. So those are all questions that I think need to be addressed before we move forward. Go ahead, Sam. I was just gonna add, this would be, um, I'm channeling uh, Heather Darby, <laughs> uh, across, uh, rotation right. um, in order to ensure you know, you're not um, perpetuating the pest in a field and that's going to actually potentially be more regular than even like an you know as Billy possibly <coughs> described an active 50 permit that dissolves after that activity no longer occurs but then it doesn't come back on um, so just another question or concern. yeah no so, yes. absolutely and, and Ryan I apologize I wasn't trying to put you on the spot thinking that you had all the answers to <laughs> To all my questions, it, it should have been better phrased. And what questions do you have 
realizing we're kind of in uncharted waters because we've got a laundry list of them and we've got to start developing answers you know through the board through our partner agencies consultants so on and so forth so i was really just trying to tease out what questions remain for you recognizing that you know this looks a little bit different than things have been i guess relatively speaking <clears throat> yeah no um I, I i appreciate the question um and, and i kind of um struggle to um, contextualize the kind of shift in thinking that a, a farm operation, an existing farm operation would need to take on um, to, to understand how the cultivation of food and crops has, uh, you know, historically been, been regulated um, that, you know, the un sharing that, yes, there's all of these unanswered areas where if you're farming, you don't have to deal with those things because you deal with the agency of agriculture. Um, but now a, a farm is going to need to uh, potentially engage with, you know, all of those different permitted areas. And uh, yeah, to Stephanie's point, it's great. You know, just from a basic agronomic uh, point of view, you know, crop rotation is really uh, important for, you know, suppression of, you know, weeds and pests and, and diseases. Um, so if you're going to have to be rotating, are all these areas of your farm going to then be subject to uh, that, um, you know, the non-farming designation? And yeah, it's just, it's very broad, right? You, you look throughout um, state law and you'll find many exemptions for farming uh, and those farms that follow the RATs. And I, I um, don't have an answer for <laughs> how comprehensive that may be, but it's definitely, I, I think if I was a farmer, there would be um, quite a lot of, um, you know, learning and planning one would have to do to um, you know, cultivate cannabis on an existing um, uh, ongoing uh, farming operation. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in addition to that, another question that I have, and, and you and I, Ryan, have been in, in farm structure meetings, variance meetings together, and you know, what happens if somebody wants to build a structure on a diversified operation that might have elements of part of their cannabis cultivation business, but also elements of or they want to, there's intended use there in the more traditional farming context and how do we treat, you know, folks that do stuff like that. So um, a lot of questions um, that I have, that we all have. Uh, James and Zoe, if you have any further questions. Um, yeah, just on a different topic, Ryan. Uh, you talked about kind of an inspection and enforcement, I guess, division or portion of, of uh, agency of agriculture's uh, jurisdiction and job. Um, so what does this look like exactly? Is your um, kind of inspections and enforcement um, annual? Is it fee supported? Is it just kind of like a site visit? Um, is it kind of, I just like to hear a little bit more about some of the enforcement um, and uh, inspection work that you all do. Sure, um, absolutely. So Agency of Agriculture um, has a lot of regulatory oversight. Uh, all I will speak to is the water quality division and uh, the inspection and investigations that, that we uh, conduct to implement uh, the RAPs. Um, as I breeze through, there's different sizes of farms in the state that trigger different levels of either permit compliance and uh, regular inspection. So uh, the smallest firms in the state are inspected on a complete driven basis. A neighbor calls in and alleges something doesn't look right, there's manure running off, they're stacking manure too close to the road. Um, that's kind of an ad hoc investigation that uh, the agency will undertake on those size farms. And of course, will conduct on any size farm where there is a complaint. Um, and that's generally limited to the specific complaint that comes in. Um, certified small farms, medium farms and large farms are inspected on regular schedules at least once every seven years for certified small farms once every three years for medium farms and annually for large farms uh, on large farms all production areas are inspected on an annual basis and a proportion of crop fields are as well and we're looking for compliance with not just all of those sections of the rap's uh, including the no discharge standard, but there are specific permit requirements 
and both the general permit for MFOs as well as individual permit requirements for large farms. Uh, and so, as I shared, we'll conduct over 500 inspections and investigations that result in uh, enforcement actions when it's a non-point source issue. When it's a point source issue, we refer it to the Agency of Natural Resources and they will take action. Or uh, we can uh, refer that to the Attorney General's Office for um, you know, prosecuting those very complicated uh, cases. And um, that is um, something that was funded by, you know, Act 64 of 2015 and the, you know, Water Quality Special Fund. Uh, it was in part funded by some fees, um, but the um, uh, Clean Water Fund uh, provides, um, you know, uh, funding to the agency for staff to implement uh, the regulatory inspection uh, program. And who pays into that? The, the farmers? No, so I'll... Uh, for the record, this is Kerry. So Ryan's team does inspections under the RAPs. I have a separate field staff that's located in different um, quadrants of the state, and we do um, not only farms, but retail inspections and golf courses. And we're, we're inspecting under the pesticide, feed seed, fertilizer, nursery, um, <coughs> vector management hemp program. So we've got a, another field set that's inspecting um, under a completely different set of statutes. And that and we're we're hitting every sort of class B pesticide dealer uh, every other year, every the golf courses every year. Um, farms it varies, but we're at the um, class A pesticide dealer quarter. So we're in the hemp program stuff, the inspection staff as well, and that's on a uh, cycle that we could use more help with. It's about, we're trying to hit 20% of our insurance in the beginning. Yeah, I think it would make sense for us to just go through the hemp program kind of soup to nuts at some point soon mm -hmm. um, to hear about some of that stuff. Well, thank you, Ryan. I hope to be able to tap into some of your, your knowledge moving forward. So if I start to annoy you, please let me know. <laughs> happy to uh, share what we do and happy to, uh, uh, yeah, happy to continue the conversation. Thanks for the opportunity to share. Appreciate it. Um, Ryan, if you could forward me a PDF of your presentation, we can get it up on our website. Will do. Thanks. Thank you. All right, thanks, Ryan. Um, so we have more public comment kind of uh, woven into this because um, these are such kind of weighty issues with large implications. Um, and so we're going to turn to public comment now. Um, we'll do it the same way we did earlier in the day. If you joined via the link uh, and you'd like to provide public comment, please raise your virtual hand. Um, and then we will move after that to the folks on the phone. So, Graham? Hey folks, this is Graham Munang, Strufenacht, Policy Director at Rural Vermont. Um, thank you, Ryan, for that presentation and also for the, the questions and comments from Carrie and Stephanie and Kyle uh, and you as well, James. Uh, I just have a couple comments, and first I just wanted to uh, address the, the comments that Tito made in our, the last public comment session, and he said that, you know, he feels like he has to speak here for sustainable indoor production, and I just wanted to, to lend support to that. I know that Rural Vermont and our coalition is here speaking to, to equitable opportunities and access for outdoor production, but we certainly want to make sure that he knows and others know that we are here to support people choosing sustainable indoor production as well. There's lots of reasons that people choose to produce in different ways. Um, we don't need to get into them all here. Um, and I think like, you know, one thing I wanted to point out is Ryan went through the RAPs and our coalition certainly presented this in our comments to the legislature, but cannabis meets all the definitions of agriculture in the RAPs. It's also a crop principally produced on the farm. Uh, we are trying to do research um, within our organization right now on commercial zoning and the intersection with ag equity and access. And I just wanna let folks know that the initial response we got from um, someone from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, I believe, 
suggested that they don't have maps on all the commercial areas or you know comprehensive maps of zoning in Vermont. But he suggested that we can sub downtown and village sensor designated areas as proxies for commercially zoned areas. So again, I just want to ask if that is what, what commercially zoned areas are, how many of them are on farms and how many of them are going to be appropriate for outdoor production? And we would imagine it's very little. Um, other barriers mentioned that weren't mentioned by Ryan and Carrie and Stephanie and Kyle are, are in the legislation. For example, one is such that security requirements are not differentiated between indoor and outdoor currently. Um, and they brought up basic agronomic methods like crop rotation. And I think, you know, the fencing requirements, et cetera, would, would currently really interrupt that. So I'll leave it there and just want to appreciate folks getting into this a little bit more. Thank you. Uh, anyone else wanting to provide public comment in this period and join via the link, um, feel free to just raise your virtual hand and we'll call on you. And anyone who might be on the phone, uh, you can unmute yourself by hitting star six. Well, we're a little ahead of schedule. I do see um, Matt, our next witness, Matt Leonetti, is, is, has joined us. I don't know, Matt, if we can take a break, if that's easier for you, um, or we could just move on to your testimony. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm happy to take a break. I'm I'm happy to just continue whatever you guys feel is is the most appropriate. Either way is fine. Let's yeah. jump into it, Matt. If, if you're willing, you know, um, you know. Thanks again for your willingness to join. I think you and I had a conversation earlier this week about what would make good for, um, you know, a presentation. Like to hear your thoughts as an environmental professional um, working in this space for some time, and also about um, one of the one of the organizations that you work for, which is uh, which is Clean Green, and, and you know how they. You know, fit into the conversation as a third party certifier. Sure. Um well, I'll say thank you to everyone uh, that's here in the meeting. I'll say thank you to the control board for for having me and allowing me to speak. Uh, I'm Matt Leonetti. I represent Clean Green. Uh, I will say I'm also a convicted felon. Uh, I was facing life in prison in the 90s for growing cannabis, so I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and I've seen this industry change uh, significantly over the last three decades. Uh, but what I will start with, because I think it, it, it's fairly appropriate um, and it will touch on, you know, a lot of the environmental stresses that cannabis will place on the environment. And that is exactly the basis why Clean Green came to being in 2004. Um, so to kind of backstep just a teeny bit, uh, Clean Green is the largest nationally recognized certifying body for cannabis uh, in the industry. Uh, and we were started in 2004. Uh, there are a lot of third-party certifiers out there. Everyone's got a little bit of a different set of teeth to them, uh, but the pillars of our program are one, legal compliance. Um, this is the first one we discuss. This is the first one we talk about. Uh, and the legal compliance aspects is, is everything. It's, it's how you're obtaining your water. It's your plant counts, uh, your wages, making sure you're paying your taxes. Uh, everything about your operation needs to be in full legal compliance. Uh, the second is the cultivation practices, and these go from seed to sale pretty much. How is your crop being grown? The source of your water, electricity, you using solar? Uh, are you part of a grid? What is that grid a part of? Uh, hydro, fossil fuels, nuclear, uh, your soil erosion protection. I, I think these a lot are, you know, just basic kind of uh, farm protection, ag protection uh, components, um, border areas, your natural vegetation, uh, facilitating beneficial insects, uh, you're next to a toxic area, do you need your buffers? And what are you doing for your pest, weed, and disease control? Um, and then, you know, one thing that I've, I really have a, an issue with is single-use plastic, but I'll, I'll jump to that as an impact later. Uh, another component of the program, which I think a lot of other third-party certifiers, as well as the USDA, kind of overlooks, is the social component. Uh, if we're talking about regenerative agriculture, I think we need to think about our farm workers and we need to make sure that, uh, you know, because these are generally a group that are marginalized. Uh, they're not treated right. They're not paid right. They're not respected. They're not treated with dignity. And I think this program uh, has decided that this is a major component um, and we need to make sure that the employees on your farm are treated as as employees with dignity, with respect uh, and that they're paid appropriately. Um, 
So once your application is completed, uh, we do a crop inspection. Um, this is where we go through all of the inputs, uh, fertilizers, pest control, sprays, potting soils, everything that is used to make sure that it is compliant um, with, you know, our, our, our parameters. Uh, and we are going off of the USDA program as a baseline, uh, but we've added an enormous amount of teeth to it. Uh, I think another very interesting component of Clean Green is that we are a carbon reduction program. And I think this ties into the statewide climate reduction goals. Uh, so every year you are required to show an annual drop in your carbon footprint by 10%. Now, there is a point of, of no return and you can only go so far with the operation that you have. However, uh, this is something that we absolutely stress. So we do not, not just hand out a renewal application. Uh, these things need to be documented, seen, proved, um, and, and some of these are very simple of collecting rainwater, switching to solar, composting, uh, plant ferments from bio waste. Uh, so I, I think that's an interesting component to, to this. Um, and then there's the final agricultural inspection, uh, which is just basically a confirmation of the cultivation and uh, the facility that was put into the application. Uh, something else that Clean Green does that I don't see with a lot of other programs uh, we require a soil sample uh, prior to the approval of your application. So we send off this sample with, that is tested out in California at an ag lab for 118 different compounds. And I think the reason for this is we know the power of this plant to remediate components out of the soil. So we're looking at things like Eagle 20, Michael Butanol, uh, where DDT is actually on the list of one of the tested because we know how that glass in, in terms of its half-life. Uh, so this is a huge component. We will not allow you to get a certification to grow on contaminated soil. So let's take a peek at that soil first and foremost to make sure what we're doing uh, is appropriate. Um, and uh, as I continue, if anyone has, uh, feels free to chime in, ask questions. If I'm, I'm moving too quick or wants to exemplify something, please do. Um, so I think when Kyle and I had spoke, we were kind of talking about some of the environmental stresses of cannabis on the environment. Uh, you know, the biggest one for me, and I'll go right back to this one, is single-use plastic. Uh, as a person who was a silent investor in a dispensary in East Oakland in California, uh, visiting the facility and seeing the enormous amount of plastic bottles used uh, for nutrients, pest and disease control, uh, is just staggering. And, and I think a lot of this has been in the news has been in our faces with the Pacific garbage patch, uh, with microplastics and everything. So uh, I think we can do a lot better um, and reduce that impact. Uh, a lot of packaging, I think, is, is not responsible, is not sustainable when there are options for biodegradable and compostable packaging that also allow some of the child resistant components to it. Uh, so I think when we look at this industry, you know, the plastics that are used are they're extensive. Uh, and I know we use a lot of plastic. I've tried to minimize that as much as possible, but there's no way not to, to use some component of this. Uh, but I think as we move forward and create this, I think there are great options uh, that can minimize that impact in our use of plastics. Um, Electricity load, you know, what are we using for electric um, and where is that actually coming from? So I think this would be probably a, a way to kind of look at indoor and outdoor where indoor is going to be a heck of a lot more intensive in terms of its electrical use. I believe it can also be done in a very smart and sustainable way. I know there are some absolutely phenomenal facilities that have uh, fully integrated lights, uh, collecting heat water from those lights, circulating it through the slabs. Uh, there are ways to make indoor facilities work extremely well, um, but the indoor load is still going to use an enormous amount of energy. And I think, you know, when we look at outdoor, uh, outdoor does not use that kind of load. We are running off the sun. It rises in the morning and it sets the days. And there's our answer. Um, so, you know, and I guess it would be the technology that is actually in those facilities and what they use. Uh, if we can get to solar, I think that would be phenomenal. Uh, LEDs seem to be kind of the way to go. I know there's a lot of varying perspectives on that for some of the older technologies, uh, but they are all there. Um, so indoor versus outdoor, you know, why I 
you know, the definition of farming that Brian Ryan gave to us, uh, if hemp falls under that, I don't understand why cannabis can't either. Um, that's a big one for me. Uh, you know, the, the other impact that we've seen, and again, this is why Clean Green was born um, in 2004, was the impact of the use of pesticides, insecticides, miticides on the crop. Um, you know, this is an economic crop. No one wants to lose everything that they've put months into this, but there are a lot of people that are more than willing to spray things. Um, and I don't think a lot of people are knowledgeable in the requirements of, of what it takes to spray appropriately. Uh, I've been a qui uh, qualified chemical applicator for about 17 years. I do not carry that licensure now, uh, but I understand, uh, you know, the biggest worry within a lot of that is the, the home grower uh, that goes out and dumps an entire load of glyphosate on a dandelion. So I, I really do worry in a new regulated market, the, the use of chemicals, uh, the use of chemicals by people that are not trained in the proper use of them, the proper handling of them, the storage of them, uh, the cleaning of containers afterwards. Uh, so I think, you know, the insecticides and the pesticides have had a significant impact on the environment as well. I think we're getting a lot better, uh, but those alone impact our soil, our water, uh, non-target species and beneficials. Um, they certainly do worry me. Uh, you know, another big impact, I think, is, uh, you know, the, the loss of nutrients, nutrient leaching um, on farm fields. And I think it comes down to a lot of better timing of applications and with taking into weather considerations. Uh, I think a lot of cannabis farmers honestly do not understand uh, the proper timing of their applications for certain nutrients. And I think that could make a big difference. Um, proper amount, the dosage, a little extra is not going to make uh, a lot of significant impact. Uh, but there are a lot of ways that we can remediate that by the use of biochar. Uh, I am also a certified green roof professional. I work in green roof design. And one of the studies that recently came out is that they are using biochar to reduce any sort of nutrient leaching off of the roofs, uh, which I've never seen before. That just popped on my radar in the last couple of days. Uh, but we do know the power of biochar as it plays into soil microbiology, the carbon to nitrogen ratio and, and all of that. So building soil organic matter, less tillage, um, permaculture practices. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that we can do as cultivators uh, to create and foster an, an industry that is sustainable, that steps above some of the commercial agriculture. Uh, and we kind of reinvent the paradigm and, and recreate it a little bit to something that has a much longer term perspective. Um, you know, indoor, uh, an impact from indoor, one thing I would like to look at is the uh, the HVAC. Uh, there's going to be on larger facilities, uh, there's going to be an enormous amount of condensate that's going to dehumidifiers. Um, and what are we going to do with that? Because that's not water that I would recommend using back on your plants because of the collection of heavy metals, bacteria, molds, uh, and everything else. So there's gotta be some sort of reclamation, some sort of remediation to that water before we see that through. Um, I think another thing that was mentioned that we took a look at that uh, was mentioned, um, the cannabis waste stream, um, and I know it varies a little bit from indoor to outdoor, but is there a way, uh, that that waste can be minimized, that that waste can be utilized in some sort of ancillary fashion. Uh, and for that, I'm thinking, you know, can biomass somehow be collected for plant ferments? Uh, we can use that for compost on the farm, close that loop and, uh, you know, reduce that carbon footprint. Um, and again, this goes back to plastics. Uh, you know, that's a waste both indoor and outdoor. Uh, I don't think black plastic row mulches should be used in outdoor cultivation because of the impact on the environment. That stuff never leaves the fields. Um, how, you know, and, and everyone's cultivation practices for their operation are going to be slightly different. Um, and everyone's gonna have a different waste stream based on what they're doing. Uh, so I think it's going to be very difficult to kind of put a, a baseline. I should, there should be a baseline, uh, but I think this would be the context of looking at each application and uh, having the applicant form an appropriate plan that could be accepted for how they are cultivating cannabis. Um, 
you know, one thing I kind of wanted to step back to that I think was mentioned several times is the uh, the designation of, of commercial. Um, and I really do believe that is a significant barrier of entry to a lot of us. Uh, Vermont has a very beautiful, diversified landscape of small craft farms all over it. I believe in the United States, we are number one in community supported agriculture, CSAs. Uh, And that is kind of our heritage and that is kind of our legacy in the state of these small farmers. Uh, We don't have large factory farms on the size of the plains in the Midwest. Um, And uh, it is our heritage to support our small farms. Um, And so this commercial zoning, I think, puts you into an area that does not provide good soils, that provides that and increased cost of operations when you're in more of an urban center than a rural area. Um, I, I really believe that, that cannabis farming um, is agricultural and, and should be relegated as such. Um, and so with that, I think that is pretty much what I had to say for the most part on clean green and some of the impacts that I have seen throughout time in, in this industry. Um, Thanks, Matt. Carrie is here in the room with us, and uh, looks like he's to ask you something. So I'm gonna I, go. I am. Hi, Matt. Uh, good afternoon. Hey, Carrie. <laughs> um, quick question. Uh, the chair opened the meeting with an announcement that uh, there was a proposal to delist uh, high THC cannabis nationally as a controlled substance or not take it down a notch and if that happens and usda is allowed to certify a cannabis crop as organic is there still space in the industry for clean green i i think there's always space for third-party certifiers um you know we we know the usda and I appreciate everything that they've done to create a baseline, but I think they are uh, basically that. They are kind of the bottom rung of the ladder, and a lot of the third-party certifiers have come out and taken those standards and gone several steps further. Now, I understand that their hands are somewhat tied because when the USDA got took over the National Organic Program, you know, industry lobbyists obviously added components for their benefit. So, The program to me is kind of the lower rung of the ladder. And I think everyone wants to differentiate themselves. Everyone wants to have different standards. And we've seen, I think here in the, in the state of Vermont, the hemp program, the amount of organic people that are are certified here is truly phenomenal. Um, But I think there are room for programs that offer different sets of standards that are are more stringent. And I'm sure there's people that are going to want them. Uh, There's there's so many. There's there's sun and earth. There's kind. I think all of these are going to exist in this marketplace, even if it does get federally changed. Um, I think the more the merrier Uh, we can hold this whole industry to a much higher standard than what we've seen in agricultural prior. I I am all for it. Um, And I think there's plenty of room for everybody here. Yeah, I haven't read all of the the proposal from Schumer, but it looks, it it sounded like he gave jurisdiction to FDA, ATF, but not USDA. So I'd be curious to see if that does move anywhere. what that would look like right. you know, work up against the hemp program. Um, any other questions from that? Matt, Matt we touched, you, you touched a little bit upon the environmental stress that, that cannabis can put on, you know, the environment. I'm wondering if you might be able to talk about the environmental benefits cannabis can bring to an environment, whether it's its ability to uptake nitrogen and so on and so forth, just for the board's knowledge and also for those listening on the phone. Sure. Um, I think any diversified operation is a wonderful thing. Um, And I think as cannabis has become legalized, everyone wants to have the best practices. Um, So I think as we move forward with that, I think there is a lot of great opportunity with a lot of great growers to kind of push and showcase and change the agricultural perspective 
uh, and push more towards organic practices, more towards biodynamic practices, more towards permaculture practices. Um, I know you spoke about remediation of, of nitrogen and other things, but I, I do know that, um, you know, when we look at elemental analysis, you know, we look at Chernobyl, they're using hemp to clean it up. What do we do with that hemp now that it is collected all of whatever it's picking up heavy metals? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I don't think cannabis should be used as a bioremediator in any way, shape or form if it's going to end up out in the open marketplace and sold to the consumer because I worry about the content of what is in it. Um, but I think the practices that that cannabis can employ, uh, you know, crop rotations, cover crops, uh, diversification within those rows, we're talking some of the best practices. And I think a lot of people are looking for, uh, and there has been a significant shift in cannabis production in the last 30 years where we went from kind of the back to the to the land movement and then all of a sudden we got into the green revolution and there were enormous amounts of just regular conventional chemicals used uh, and we have shifted more towards you know soil you know the benefits of our soil microbiology uh, pushing that with the the microbes and and using a lot more microbiology to cultivate our cannabis and reduce the amount of impact from fertilizers from pest sprays so getting back to some of our best practices i think this industry is really taking a hold to um, and i think that is a wonderful thing to see and i think most growers would want to be in that no-till that living soil have those best practices because i think that's what consumers are now looking for um and it's yeah sorry brain fart um it's all good you've given us a lot of information i thank you um yeah thanks a lot matt thanks for joining us today um and i'm sure we'll be talking to you again in the future as we move forward I appreciate you having me. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, thank you to all you guys are doing and uh, everyone's comments have been wonderful. It's been great to hear all the uh, the folks speak today. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. I know we're running about 20 minutes ahead of schedule, which is shocking. And folks have been tracking our meetings typically are 20 minutes behind schedule. But Jacob, it, it looks like you're with us. Um, if you're ready to, to move a little bit early. Hey, how's it going? Hey, going well. How are you? so much for having me it's a pleasure to be here being able to speak to uh you guys today um yeah so i was listening here and there throughout today so kind of um just highlighted some things that maybe haven't been mentioned before 
Um, I definitely want to start with saying, like, while there are environmental implications of, you know, cannabis recreational legalization, there also are a lot of benefits. Um, you know, I think, you know, on a macro scale, you are bringing economically viable business owners and community members, um, you know, into this marketplace um, who are or will be, you know, stewards of the land. That's kind of what we're seeing. I think right now we oversee over 100 farms in eight states and two provinces um, and do a bit of international work as well. And for the most part, I feel like cannabis cultivators um, are stewards of their land and do and do value that. So I do think you're, you're bringing on um, or, you know, supporting, um, you know, good community members. Um, also think from a small farmer, small farmer perspective, you know, you're, they're adding the ability to add a luxury crop into what they're already cultivating. And I think that is a huge economic uh, boon to a lot of struggling farms, especially small farmers around the country. Um, and I think there's also the, you know, a true economic opportunity for the underserved and underprivileged, you know, community members um, out there, uh, you know, the ability to own businesses, uh, to create generational wealth, you know, this is what the cannabis industry does bring to, to different states as they become uh, legalized. Um, and then I think from like an environmental perspective, you know, we are seeing, especially for outdoor greenhouse growers, you know, increase in biodiversity, increase in habitat improvement, infrastructure improvement, soil health, things like that. Um, I think from, uh, you know, and prep for this, I talked to quite a few different state regulators and municipal regulators uh, in the cannabis industry to kind of see what their, you know, lessons learned were. And, you know, I think um, with the way Vermont is structured and my understanding that um, municipalities and counties do look to the state for guidance. Um, in Colorado, we have home rule. So counties kind of create their own uh, or can create more um compliant or, or stricter regulation. So there's a little bit of uh, a difference between what the state has passed and then what local communities actually uh, do. But I think from a Vermont perspective, I think the state does have an opportunity to really set standards for sustainability and have them valued alongside other health and safety licensing issues. Um, what we see a lot in most states, uh, Washington, Oregon, California, you know, Colorado is like uh, sustainability has always been an add on and that they're not really um, from a, I guess, regulatory perspective, um, given, uh, you know, such value as all of the other things. And from a operator perspective, you know, where we're most are interested in, you know, maintaining compliance to maintain their license and so they'll be able to conduct business. So I think at the get go, being able to kind of pair the sustainability regulations with everything else is, is you know, is a big win. Um, and then also having all of the different state regulatory bodies and the stakeholders, business operators, you know, really understanding the intent behind the regulations, the process for it, and then the implementation is really important as well. So just some things that uh, came um, that I wanted to mention. So as far as energy, um, I did see that in the previous uh, speaker at the beginning um, in their uh, talk, they talked about the requirements for renewables. While I really like that, I do want to point out that what we're seeing in most states is that there is a split dilemma between the operator of the business and the building owner, and that actually implementing um, installing solar panels is uh, usually uh, a burden um, to the operator because they're going to see the benefits, but they don't actually own the building. And so understanding how that's going to play in Vermont, um, a lot of why we're seeing you know, operations come in and take over older buildings was because, in, especially in Colorado, there was a one-year operational requirement to get your license. So you had to actually be operating in one year, and it was too risky to kind of build specific cultivation facilities. You know, we're seeing a lot uh, that's changing a lot now. We're kind of in our third iteration, I would say, of the industry out here. Um, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, and also, I think access to capital, especially traditional capital, is can, you know, not as wealthy applicants be able to actually afford to build a building or to retrofit and maybe potentially offering a credit for building retrofits so that building was used for something else and they're improving it, especially building envelope what you know what is that uh trade-off in uh, potential carbon emissions um and then also the applicability of it you know 0.5 i think kilowatts per square foot um with an indoor grow you know the lighting intensity and the energy demand you know how you know feasible is that in different scenarios, whereas I think other options are potential renewable energy credits, so RECs, or having carbon offsets. Uh, the one thing I would say is if you guys are going to do promote uh, accept carbon offsets is to have those pre-approved. I was just talking to Boulder County, Boulder City, and that was a big issue, um, is they had requirements for that, but they didn't actually know which ones they would accept. Um, so making sure that they are um, you know, legitimate carbon credits. Um, and then, um, the 
other uh, I just want to point out is like we work a lot. We're mainly with mostly working with small growers, even though we, we do work with a few um, MSOs, multi-state operators. Um, but with the grows that are very environmentally friendly um, or sustainable or even off grid, generating their own power, the harvesting issue, they usually require a lot more energy than they would year round from when they're harvesting. So they have to bring in um, either gas generators or cold storage trucks um, to maintain the quality control as they're, as they're harvesting because it's, you know, quite a, like taking a whole harvest, uh, you know, within a, a few days um, and, and dealing with that. Then um, I didn't have too much. I have to do some calculations on some of the HVAC stuff. But one thing I did want to point out was it's not really mentioned in the climate control aspect of how the equipment is being used. I don't know if that's something the Vermont that you guys want to actually take on or if that's too prescriptive. Um, but, you know, big things we're seeing for optimizing indoor cultivators is equipment staging. So having variable speeds on fans, having multiple output options for exhaust or lighting banks or heating zones or light deprivation. Um, it's really just using the amount of power you actually need um, is you know one of the big ways we're seeing a reduction in energy use as well as kind of set point optimization. And I just think that there's just wanted to highlight there's a difference between what equipment you can use and then how are you actually using the equipment. Um, I did like seeing that you guys were um, or they were considering um, uh, like facility maintenance plans and ensuring the optimization of the equipment that's in place. I think it's really important. Um, and then for the reporting requirements, um, I do think reporting requirements are important, but um, is Vermont considering providing resources such as expert advice to growers? So like, what do you do with that information? Uh, the reason I bring that up is I was just talking with, uh, so Boulder County and Boulder City have an environmental impact offset fund. So essentially it's an energy fee. Uh, so I think it's 2.16 cents a kilowatt hour in Boulder County and 2.09 cents a kilowatt hour in Boulder City. Um, and the reason for that was one is to like finance um, like kind of community supported solar um, initiatives, renewable energy initiatives, but it was also to, by charging a fee, um, having kind of that, you know, polluter pays understanding there, but it hasn't actually translated into energy reductions. So I think there's that next step on actually guiding cultivators um, or operators into what to do with this information, what to do with these benchmarks. And I think thinking about how that all aligns with what Vermont state's goals are, as far as are you guys trying to develop uh, or increase more you know, community solar or more renewable power, you know, the cannabis industry, I think, could easily support those initiatives. Um, and then also when it comes to auditing and oversight, just making sure you guys have the teams in place beforehand um, and understanding kind of what those things include. Um, as far as water, um, I would just say learning from some stuff that Massachusetts was doing and talking with some uh, Massachusetts growers, you know, they, uh, with the water testing requirements on sourcing of water is, I guess, there's no biological um, allowed. So it's requiring almost all grows to go with an RO system. And that's an increased energy consumption, usually overkill for most parts, um, or uh, some kind of like sedimentary filter, but most are just going with RO and that's kind of mandated and it's gonna, you know, it's not a very efficient process. Um, but as far as actual irrigation, fertigation, you know, most grows are using a high efficiency technology such as drip irrigation or general had mentioned before, like blue mats. Um, I would say from my conversations with uh, Denver Municipal Water um, throughout for the last 10 years, they have not seen any strain on their wastewater systems and we don't have any uh, requirements. Um, a lot of growth, especially originally, we're just doing straight, you know, uh, uh, waste right into the municipal water system and so they did not see um, any issues with that um, most of that will be i think in um you know fertigation stuff so um, nitrogen phosphorus uh, potassium so you definitely wouldn't want that um at, you know going straight into uh, open waterways um and then i think there's a lot of options for discharge on farms um, we see a lot of farms doing constructed wetlands things like that um as far as waste, it's great to hear that you guys are um, having um, biomass collection and composting. I would just uh, make sure that that is expressly allowable in the regulations. Um, that was a big unintended consequence to um, Colorado's 
uh, waste uh, regulations. So we had in there um, all cannabis waste, so stems, uh, root balls, uh, leaf material, um, had to be mixed 50-50 with, and rendered unrecognizable and useless. And that just caused a massive, and it all had to be landfilled. So the Marijuana Enforcement Division here, as of 2021, has now, they didn't change the regs, but they changed the interpretation of the regs, allowing an exemption for organic materials to now be um, uh, collected and composted either on site or at a facility. Um, but then it's also, how is that process done? Uh, it's something that I'm trying to figure out for some growers right now is the hauling issue is, is something that we're working on because it was kind of banned. So now that it's legal, how do all of the stakeholders understand that this is now you know possible? Um, I think also allowing on-site biochar, anaerobic, or bukashi, or biomass gasification as possibilities. And then um, uh, what the gentleman before me was just saying is, yeah, consumer waste, single-use plastics. I think that is a big issue we've been trying to tackle since the beginning, is uh, what to do with all of these single-use plastic containers um, and the ability to collect containers. So that was also now being allowed in 2021. Um, is that uh, retailers are now allowed to collect um, previously used cannabis containers. Before it was illegal because of the concern of like residue and it having cannabis residue in there and then that being, uh, um, so now we're able to do it and we've been working a lot on like take back schemes to try to limit those use because there is somewhat of consistency in packaging, um, but then also um, having you guys think about yeah child resistant packaging and how that interplays with sustainable packaging um, and essentially not requiring additional layers, additional material, um, you know, and just generating bulk waste, I would say. Um, then other things that have come to mind is, and I don't know if you guys have thought about this um, or where things stand within the, the medical cannabis um, industry right now, but um, allowable pesticides. Are you guys considering just doing like Massachusetts 25B exempt or going along the lines of organic and allowing organic materials? Um, I think from a farmer perspective, uh, there's definitely uh, impacts on there and what's being used. Um, and then uh, I think testing levels for microbials. I don't know if you guys have thought about that yet, but um, either looking at feasible limits or specific pathogens because most of the limits for a lot of states are very low, and especially Massachusetts are now requiring remediation technology. Um, and that can be as simple as like hydrogen peroxide, um, but a lot of people now are using kind of these like extra technology that is uh, generating a lot more energy demand um, to, to, to remediate product that doesn't necessarily have to be remediated. Um, and then um, from an outdoor perspective, something that we're tackling now here in Colorado is like cross-pollination issues and how um, you know cannabis and hemp uh, operators can be good neighbors and what that looks like because uh, of the issue both sides. Um, if you're having pollen in the environment of potentially testing to INTHC for hemp or lowering yields for, for recreational um, or medical. And then um, also the volunteer issue. Um, what's who's responsible and what are the issues around cannabis uh, plants that like grow naturally due to seeds just being in the environment and how is that uh, going to be addressed and then um i think from a, a track and trace perspective um if you guys are going to be doing metric or another similar program um for one thing we just are i think we actually just got passed yesterday um in colorado was uh the ability to have weather contingency plans for outdoor growers. And so there usually is like a 30 day um, uh, within the system, within metric, you have to let the uh, compliance authority know that you'll be harvesting within 30 days, but that doesn't give you enough time if there's going to be a freeze or hail or something like that. So it allows for, you know, essentially adaptation based on weather uh, to really promote more um, outdoor cultivation um, or passive greenhouse cultivation. Um, and then there is definitely a burden on the track and trace with, I would say, infield trimming and manicuring and just you have to weigh those things and apply them into metric or if they're not leaving site and they're just being on, you know, on site composted, is that allowed without having to be, you know, dragged inside and weighed and then um, implemented? There's definitely a, a administrative burden um, on especially small growers um, having to deal with compliance. So I think um, understanding that as well. 
And then um, as far as promoting, I would say, small farmers and um, or mitigating the risk of just being taken over by large, you know, multi-state operators, limiting the number of licenses a business can own and potentially the size of each license. Um, one question I think to think about is how are you guys determining canopy size? Is that just for flower? Is that bed size? Uh, is that drip size of full plants? Are aisles included or exempt? Um, we've run into issues, uh, first one comes to mind is like California, between how Humboldt County classifies canopy size versus how the state classifies that. And so it just leads to a lot of headaches for, for farmers as well as even state regulators on figuring that out. Um, I'll say making sure that you guys are promoting diverse crop production and avoiding monoculture. So allowing for polyculture and companion planting and intercropping and things like that and not segregating cannabis to its own sector due to uh, security or fencing or, or other limitations. Because I think cannabis really does benefit from um, having been beneficial in sectaries and being part of a holistic kind of ecosystem. Um, and also not limiting farms who, you know, want to intercrop with other, you know, medicinal plants, um, not being able to use that or sell that because they were grown within their, you know, license. Um, other, briefly, other things that came to mind was um, when thinking about the tax structure, uh, try not to make it a burden on the farmer. They're definitely the lowest person on the totem pole and usually get taxed, you know, the highest, whereas distributors, processors, retailers do make the bulk of the profits. Um, in this cannabis industry. And so, um, you know, understanding that, especially from a, a small farmer perspective, uh, and it really does avoid a, a race to the bottom of everyone trying to grow the cheapest cannabis possible. Um, you know, if they're not taxed as much and they can actually make this economically viable on a small scale, um, I think it lends itself to having more environmental stewardship, you know, at the get go. Um, other things to think about, I think it was like the as the gentleman I think asked the question earlier is how will federal legalization kind of impact this? That's what we're looking at in Colorado and other states as well. Um, we just enacted with uh, this uh, kind of outdoor um, policy here, the ability for, um, uh, I think it's outdoor, potentially the entire cannabis industry, if it does go federal, federally legal, to be then classified as a legal crop um, to avoid kind of a lot of these uh, cannabis taxes so that they are economically viable in a national uh, marketplace. Um, so I think, you know, as you guys are building out this, this market and this industry um, that I'm assuming federal legalization is gonna happen at some point um, that, you know, everyone who's investing capital in this does still have a place um, in the federal legalization and doesn't just, you know, explode open and then close down because it might be cheaper um, or more beneficial to grow it, you know, somewhere else. And then um, thinking about regulations, most states don't really have them, but for uh, supply chain quality control, um, the amount of times I, mean, I do hundreds of audits every year, um, we do pull things off the shelf and send them to laboratories for testing and, you know, making sure that once it is leaving the farm, you know, it's tested before it has to sell the distributor, but then from the distributor to the retailer, retail to the public, are is cannabis and cannabis products being um, stored properly so that you, so that's more like a health and safety issue but I think also from a um, you know quality control supply chain and just industry integrity standpoint and then um, allowing for um, on-site processing on the farm and what those policies would look like regulations and then um, potentially farm gate sales as well and allowing the opportunity for small farmers to be able to sell directly to the public, um, you know, that is kind of, I think, a virtue of Vermont's, you know, craft beer industry and a lot of other industries and um, having cannabis aligned with that, I think, would be uh, extremely beneficial. So I think that's most of what I've got. You just ran the gamut of everything that we're thinking about. I don't know where to jump in. I mean, you and I have had multiple conversations extensively over the last month or so. So, James, you will um, I have a question, and I'm not quite sure who to ask it, but the, you, you were talking about cannabis size and, and things like that. If, does Colorado designate cannabis as an agricultural product, I or, or do Colorado make such designations? Like, do they do that? Um, uh, originally, um, it was not, and that led to a lot of a, a lot of issues. Um, but also because of how Colorado is. Um, done on the county has 
I guess, final approval or say in what goes on. So we still have counties in Colorado that have banned um, recreational cannabis, um, whereas others allow for it. So in, Bol in, in Denver specifically, we originally did not allow for greenhouses. And now that they are allowed, there's not, um, it's a very onerous process to get a greenhouse um, because uh, the zoning authority just doesn't really have experience with it. And so I know multiple um, operators who want to transition from a, um, you know, a 70s building that they took over into a state of the art um, greenhouse and they're having issues with transferring licenses, but then also getting those, um, you know, approved. And that's led to 85, 90 percent of all cultivation facilities, uh, if not more in the city being on site or sorry, indoors, which is, you know, not necessarily put a tax on our grid, but is a massive, you know, carbon emission um, source. Uh, Jacob, thanks for joining us. Um, you know, one thing you mentioned about uh, kind of small cultivators and not and trying to create, uh, you know, economically viable business for them, you know, is, you know, something that we're trying to weigh on heavily and it kind of counts, it cuts against having all sorts of environmental and energy sustainability regulations for these folks, just even though it's really important. I'm wondering um, how do you kind of thread that needle and is there a way to kind of phase up, um, you know, maybe have less regulations in year one and then kind of phase them up for small cultivators or, you know, I know certain like infrastructure that they're going to have to buy around lighting and things, you're not going to want to buy one set of light bulbs in year one and then a totally new set in year two, but are there ways that you've seen maybe in Colorado or elsewhere to kind of phase up regulation so it's not as onerous in year one? Um, yeah, I definitely think there is ways of phasing regulation, specifically if you're looking at like uh, fish and wildlife regulations or the environmental impacts for outdoor, outdoor um, or greenhouse cultivators um, and not requiring to be uh, like requiring plans, potentially like a three year plan. Um, you know, we saw um, a massive shrink, I would say, of the legacy growers in Northern California when the new kind of trailer bill was enacted um like 2018 uh because of the oversight of fish and wildlife and you know just having to change culverts you know a couple of inches of these hundred thousand dollar kind of changes um you know put a lot of growers out of the uh, out of business um and so i think um one i think is how you approach the different stakeholders and and understanding the intent and they understanding the intent of what um these you know regulations are trying to achieve and then working towards them and having um potentially more of a not so restrictive um process i, I there's definitely you know public health and and in and, and human health you know safety requirements and, and all of that but i think um having them demonstrate how they will achieve these goals and maybe a multi-year process um especially when financial uh, considerations are, are there i think as far as equipment um, issues, uh, you know that's what um, I think we're seeing in in Massachusetts, where when they calculated their, um, it was it was unclear how to calculate canopy. So a lot of early adopters calculated canopy, I believe, in just flower rooms, they didn't include aisles um, or included aisles, whatever it was. It was to make sure that they were in that you know 36 watt per square foot realm, but when in reality they weren't there. And now they've just kind of been grandfathered in. So that's not really what you want to see um, either. But I think for capital investments, um, having practices in place um, at the get-go is probably the best way of going about it. But then I think looking at if someone is buying a disused building and is going to repair that and going to fix up, you know, that part of the neighborhood, um, potentially having a plan to implement the various um, building envelope requirements um you know or, or, or lighting requirements or having an incentive to go above and beyond what you're requiring whether that's in um less you know county or municipal oversight um or reduction in taxes something like that um so i think there's kind of a you know some carrot and stick to to, to play around with um but i think it's uh I feel strongly uh, with that the, the intention of the grower and bringing them into the conversation um, and how they're treated from the regulatory, you know, agencies um, 
uh, really matters and, and and making sure that it's like a good relationship because then uh, business owners you know are doing this for the longevity and want to have good relationships with their their auditors their inspectors their you know commissioners whoever it would be. so I think it's a it's a lot of like explaining the regulations and what we're really striving for um, and not necessarily um, overly punishing someone who you know mistakenly you know did something that kind of thing. Yeah. Hope that answered your question. I felt like I kind of took a little bit of a tangent. No, it it does. Yeah, and I I do like kind of, you know, potentially idea of recs or carbon offsets, you know, as as a way to kind of maybe in year two uh, offsetting some of your carbon footprint as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think also what's missing a lot from the energy efficiency conversation is, um, you know, when you're looking at metrics, you have your energy use, but you also have your production. And the production should be increasing, you know, annually. So you are efficiency wise getting better. Um, so, you know, I think from where a grower starts in their first year to where they are in their second year or after, you know, four or five cycles, they will automatically be a lot more, you know, I think efficient. Um, and then um, I think, you know, what's going to be interesting in Vermont is also genetics plays a big role in this as well. And finding um, strains that are optimized for climate as well for indoor cultivation. You know, we're seeing a lot more kind of autoflower coming in, uh, which <clears throat> is a uh, cannabis that's not um, photo period. So it's going to automatically flower, um, not the same yield, um, but we're seeing a lot of growth supplement with that um, kind of pre and post to so extend the, the season. Um, and, uh, you know, it requires um, it can be grown outdoors without supplemental lighting, um, regardless of season and things like that. So I think there's a lot of um, operational efficiencies that we're seeing just to make ends meet because it is kind of a bit of an overly taxed industry. Um, and as well as like the 280E federally, you know, there's not as much deductions that cannabis operators can take. So, so profit margins are, are definitely concerned for, um, you know, a lot of operators. Yeah. Any other questions for Jacob? Um, yeah, I'm good at the moment, Kerry. Sure. Uh, Jacob, thank you for joining us. I'm with Kerry here. I'm with the Agency of Agriculture. Um, just sitting in the board today. And quick question. A few years ago, all the headlines we saw coming out of Colorado were about uh, pesticide residues and pesticide misuse. Um, any advice how to sort of avoid that scenario? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it came from, um, well, there's a couple of things with that. I mean, one was, um, it was like equal 20, very bad pesticides. It was like a legacy holdover from a lot of like Northern California growers, you know, who kind of came in to, to Colorado and, um, was what they were used to. And there was no oversight, um, or very little oversight from the state level. Like there wasn't a state lab to actually send products to. No one really wanted um, ownership of that kind of, uh, um, you know, that process, um, like the liability and responsibility of a, a state agency. Also, I think when we started cannabis, it wasn't really, you know, the agencies weren't funded very well. Um, and so you had a lot of growers who resorted to that um, when they were facing kind of critical crop loss. Um, and uh, yeah, so when we finally started to do it, um, yeah, all of those bad actors who I believe shouldn't be in the industry to begin with, um, have left. And now the state has kind of what we call like a cannabis Bible, but like an approved, um, pesticide use, um, uh, guide book that gets updated, I believe annually. And now everyone that I know, like just uses that. So if it's not on there and that's based off of also, um, active ingredient as well as product name. Because uh, a lot of products might have um, other either inert ingredients or or minor active ingredients that are not you know necessarily labeled uh, or on the label. So pretty much every grower I know now uses that guidebook and will only use that. And it's also easier for um, the uh, um, what's it called agencies to to oversee that in their audits. Um, and then I think also the testing processing has gotten a lot better. I mean you're always going to run into it's something we do with our audits is uh, you know we require um kind of st- standardized testing to make a representative sample akin to what like global gap requires or um iso 1000 uh, 1722 don't call me on that one um 
things, but you're always going to have people cherry pick. And I think a lot of it has to come with the um, oversight and integrity of the labs as well. I mean, there's definitely still in other states kind of a pay to play. Um, you know, if you pay an extra whatever, you will get a clean result like that needs to get, um, you know, out of the industry as well. Um, but I think also that comes into what are the testing requirements? You know, our big thing right now is like heavy metals and where those levels are set because cannabis is a bioaccumulator on some level. Um, but also, you know, making sure that you're not requiring like zero, um, you know, colony forming units and that there is, you know, some leeway realizing that this is an agricultural product, even if it's not labeled that by the state. Um, but that is why, you know, we dry and cure I mean, as a traditional, you know, technique for ensuring safety. Um, and so, but I think a lot of it just had to do with what people knew, um, especially when they were facing, um, you know, uh, a, a massive financial impact. Um, but that's pretty much gone away now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jacob. Really appreciate it. I look forward to, to catching up with you down the road. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, should I stay on for public comments or? Uh, you're more than welcome to continue to stay on if you if you want through the end of the meeting. Cool. Thank you much. Thank you. Well, uh, let's see. It's uh, roughly quarter to three. Um, we have one last witness. We're about 15 minutes ahead of schedule at this point. Um, but Sam, if you're here and you want to uh, just go ahead, awesome. Um, we'll just kind of skip over. We, we won't take a break right now and we'll get right to you. Sam, you're muted. Hi, thanks for having me. How you doing? Yeah, of course. Maybe you can just introduce yourself and, um, you know, kind of what, what you want to talk to us about. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Sam Bromberg. I own and operate Mountain Fire Farm. I would, I am now considered a small farming operation, and a large part of that is due to my maple syrup production. And I am a cannabis cultivator. I have grown hemp in this state. I have been a medical patient in Rhode Island, when I lived in Rhode Island, I've cultivated cannabis since 2013, and I became interested in advocacy for cannabis in about 2005 or 2006 as an undergraduate student, where I started a Students for a Sensible Drug Policy chapter, interned with Rhode Island's Medical Marijuana Advocacy Program, and in that decade and a half of advocacy, my number one priority has been equitable access to the marketplace and laws, rules, and regulations that are based in science and not fear. Great. So I was told that y'all would like to have a candid conversation. Would you like me to start by going through my sort of list of things that I would like to talk about? Or do you have any yeah, questions please. that you would like to jump right into? No, you can go through your list and then maybe we'll open it up to questions afterwards. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today. I think that it's extraordinarily important for you to hear voices who are small farmers who would like to participate in a regulated, taxed, and legal market. Um, the current rollout of cannabis laws is so new across the board and across all the different states that I consider it to be an experiment. And it's important to recognize that Vermont has an opportunity to learn from other states' implementations during this process, in particular, those that create a market that is open and equitable for all of those who would like to participate from customer to cultivator. An example of how laws can be made more creative in the modern times is how Vermont, along with some of our neighboring states, created laws that allowed for the delivery of alcoholic beverages and takeout alcoholic beverages as a response to social distancing needs due to the pandemic. And many of these states have transitioned these temporary laws to permanent laws because it was found to be beneficial for local businesses. So just because there has never been a, or because there aren't many examples of cannabis delivery services in many states, that doesn't mean that it is not something that could exist in Vermont and, and probably should exist in Vermont. 
But I'm here to talk to you more about cultivation in the context of energy and land use. And very briefly, there is a great distinction between indoor cultivation, outdoor cultivation, and mixed light cultivation. And in my mind, outdoor sun-grown cultivation is farming. Indoor cultivation is the production of a product and regulating them in the same manner will most likely lead to a burden of compliance that is extraordinarily difficult for a small farm or a small farm operation to achieve. Um, in Ryan Patch's presentation, the RAP seems to indicate under what is farming that sun-grown cultivation meets the state's criteria for farming. It includes the on-site storage, preparation, and sale of agricultural products primarily produced on the farm. I personally believe that a system that allows immediate access to the market for small farmers to sell to directly to consumers would meet and match many of the goals that already exist within the state's agricultural program. An example of this is poultry processing. As a small farm operation, I'm able to raise and process poultry with a very different level of oversight as long as the quantity that I am raising stays, I believe, below an average of 50 birds per week. Whereas a large poultry farm that is processing hundreds if not thousands of birds on average per week has a, has a significantly greater um, compliance demand. There is a difference in the, as you've already, and a lot of the things I'm telling you today, you've already heard from the other presenters who have given a tremendous amount of information, but there is a difference in the energy requirements for cultivating indoors using artificial lighting and outdoors. And I'm not going to say that indoor cultivation cannot be done in a sustainable manner, but I will say that it is very hard for me to grasp how indoor cultivation will ever be as environmentally feasible and have the same low environmental impact as outdoor cultivation. Now, from a business operator perspective, cultivating outdoors is sort of terrifying. There are variables such as pests, weather, um, ant wild animals, uh, mold, uh, many different things that can impact an outdoor crop that are not able to be controlled as easily outdoors as indoors. So how does someone make a business decision to cultivate outdoors when it may be sustainable compared to indoors. And part of that is by incentivizing small growers to grow outdoors. If a, there is a limit of a thousand square feet cultivation for indoors, then an outdoor grower being able to grow in for six months out of the year could be a large, by giving the cultivator a larger size to grow in. So this could encourage businesses who might say, let's grow indoors to instead say, well, we can grow a little bit more outdoors. This is better for the environment. Well, if there's an incentive, then maybe more people will grow outdoors. Um, when it comes to permitting and oversight, the RAP has a a fantastic guide for this, that the larger you are, the more oversight you have. Now, this doesn't mean that there's no oversight. It doesn't mean that there are no regulations, but having regulations and compliance as something that is feasible for a small farmer is extraordinarily important. Uh, in, a, in a prior life, I managed point of sale systems and credit card security systems. And they based their processing based upon tiers. If you processed over X dollars, you were tier one. If you processed between 
X and Y dollars, you were tier two. If you were, if you processed another, it was tier three. And the tier two and tier one requirements required a significant amount of auditing to the point where it went from being a part-time job to a full-time job just to complete the annual auditing required by these by these major companies. And I think that we've seen in other states through the use of metric or other track and trace programs that these have become extraordinarily burdensome for the small farmer. And a burdensome compliance system is worse, in my opinion, than a compliance system that is a little bit lighter touch because something that is achievable will actually get done. Whereas something that is burdensome is going to be avoided and um, it, it will drive people out of the industry who would otherwise have a very good business. And again, this isn't to say that there should be no compliance and no oversight. It just really needs to be done in a manner that is fair for the farmer. Um, my, my greatest concern that I had in my previous life with credit card security was that those compliance costs were always dumped onto the farmer or, well, in that case, it was onto the retailer. And I, I'm extraordinarily concerned about what the costs of compliance will be. Now, the, the cannabis marketplace is brand new. It's in its infancy. And when we compare the cannabis market and the products that will be created to other industries such as alcohol that are more mature, we see that quality starts to become a deciding factor for the consumer. And quality is something that when it comes to cultivating cannabis is very difficult to do at a large scale. So having small scale cultivators, not limiting the number of small scale cultivators within this state and allowing those small scale cultivators to access the market will create, will help create something, will help create products on these farms that are sustainable as the cannabis industry matures and grows and as customers start to want smaller batch, higher quality products or just products that they know where they are from. Um, I, I could talk about a lot of different things, but I, I really wanted to talk primarily about how land use will impact farmers and how zoning restrictions could be used to prevent uh, equal opportunities within the marketplace. Great. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for bringing up the security um, bit and that, that experience you have. Maybe we'll leverage some of, some of your knowledge down the road when we start to think more substantively about uh, cash management and security concerns when it comes to a retail operation or how that might differ from an indoor versus an outdoor operation as well. Any more questions for Sam? Um, I don't have any questions. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, Sam, I mean, you and I had a great conversation the other night. Um, I'm not gonna put you on the spot. You had some, some, some cool concept ideas um, we can visit those later unless you want to you want to talk about them now, but no pressure. Uh, I mean, I, I think that talking about incentivizing farmers or cultivators to utilize what nature is giving us to cultivate cannabis is just it's extraordinarily important. And I don't know if that's much of a conversation than a statement. <laughs> a statement. No, 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 I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to force your hand to, to elaborate on that, but um, look forward to, to working with you and tapping into some of your ideas and knowledge as we move through this process. Thanks for being here, Sam. James, you've got nothing for me? <laughs> I, uh, I do, I do have some, some thoughts. Uh, I mean, really like uh, we've been hearing over and over again about this ag versus commercial distinction. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to think, you know, how, how do you as a small farmer give the folks that made that distinction in our legislation the assurance that, you know, um, this industry isn't going to be harmful to the environment, to, you know, this, 
I think the thinking was is the right to farm and other issues associated with agricultural products are going to, um, you know, allow a certain allowances, create certain allowances for farmers that uh, they wanted to just avoid the issue altogether. Um, I don't know. You know, this, I think that that's the, the thinking in the legislature, um, and it'd be nice to hear maybe from you how, you know, if this was reclassified as an agricultural product, how we could, how you as a farmer might be able to convince the legislature that um, that the, some of their worst fears aren't going to be realized. Sure. So I, I think it's important to start by clarifying what some of these worst fears are. And from my perspective, I I hear regularly two two primary fears. There's the environmental fear of pesticides and runoff and waste. And then there is the other fear of um, non-adult use. Do you have any other specific concerns that you'd also like me to address? You know, I wasn't even around. I wasn't paying attention to the testimony. I don't know um, what, what else came up in committee, but you could certainly talk about those. I know, so, also, Sam, you know, we had also, you know, uh, it's also my understanding that there's, there's constant anxiety, you know, I think from, from folks that are with us on the call now, but also at the legislative level that, you know, multi-state operators would, you know, look to come into Vermont, buy large swaths of land, and look to over-exploit a lot of the exemptions that we talked about through Ryan's presentation that, that agriculture typically enjoys. So I think that was likely involved in the calculus as to why this, this was designated commercial versus agricultural. I'm looking to carry too, if you might have some some thoughts here, but, but, you know, using that as a, a launch pad, Sam, we'd like to hear your thoughts. I'll, I'll address the waste aspect first and pesticide use. That is something that should be highly regulated. And it is something that it is a lot easier to handle the waste and cultivation of cannabis at a smaller scale than it is at a larger scale. When when you talk about growing 25 plants, 50 plants, 100 plants, there is there is an actual exponential difference in the amount of waste and pesticide usage that you might have to use compared to 1,000, 10,000, or 100,000 plants. Uh, their hands-on and being able to actually handle things allows a farmer to notice issues and problems that a large-scale commercial operation may not be able to notice. In, um, in, in my opinion, agri the agricultural farming of cannabis could be something that is tied into license size to prevent a large-scale operation from coming in, as you said, and sort of destroying the landscape. I, I'm not the person who should tell you what those sizes should be or what the limits should be, what, what is fair. And I think that a craft cultivator is farming, and I think a small-scale cultivator can be farming, and I think that a large-scale cultivator could also be farming. But it needs, as those... Um, levels are reached and those size sizes of businesses are met that different levels of regulation can help um, and ensure the safety of the environment as far as products reaching the community and members of the community who are underage or for whatever other reason should not be getting these products I think that the green market or regulated market solves that problem. By getting rid of an illicit market, by degrading a black market, you are left with businesses and people who are members of those communities. And members, there is a an obligation as a community member for, for many people and many business owners to do good and to be good members of the community. And business owners and businesses who do not act well and do not abide by the laws in the, that are for the state or their community very frequently go out of business. So much like 
liquor stores and breweries are not selling out their doors to children. I think that it is very important to recognize that cannabis business owners will take laws and regulations just as seriously and that there should be repercussions for anybody who does anything otherwise. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, any further questions? I think I'm good for now, but thank you, Sam, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll certainly reach out if um, you know I need any clarifying answers. All right, Thanks thank you very much. The, the only other thing I would like to say is that cultivating cannabis outdoors in Vermont is not easy. And there are a lot of people who want to do something that is very difficult. And y'all are in a position where you can essentially make it easier or harder. And I'm not going to encourage you to do anything that would put anybody's health at risk or the environment at risk but I would encourage you to please do whatever it is that you can to make sure that every Vermonter who would like to participate can participate. The, the war on drugs has made it so many people have been directly harmed by cannabis laws, and this is an opportunity to right that wrong. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. All right. Next on our agenda today is public comment. Um, this is our last public comment of the day, so uh, we'll follow the same procedure. Uh, if you'd like to provide a public comment to the board and you've joined us through the link, please raise your virtual hand. Jesse Lynn. Hi, thanks for having me and letting me comment. Oh. Okay, is that better? There we go. Yeah, way better. So, I just wanted to quickly speak to Clean Green as a the first certified Clean Green farm here in Vermont and kind of respond to what Carrie had asked. Um, Clean Green to me is a little different and there's a reason I chose Clean Green instead of USDA Organic and I just wanted to throw some of those reasons out there to you. Sorry, I'm out of breath. I just ran in from the greenhouse. Whew, okay, um, I was waiting for public comment, but I was out with the plan. So I apologize for um, breathing heavy at you. Um, so Clean Green does mandate soil testing, like Matt said. They 100% of farms are soil tested, where the national average for USDA from, from my stats that I understand is about 5%. That's a big difference to me. Another difference that was really important is that they mandate parameters for clean, um, for for drying parameters. So you have to have non-porous cleanable washing surfaces where the USDA hemp program, one of the differences is that they allow it up to a farmer's best judgment, which some, some might make wonderful judgments. Sometimes we do worry, where are they drying and can that be a cause of some of those contaminants? Um, so a couple of things I, again, wanted to just mention is the zero net as the goal through the carbon reduction program is another reason that I went with clean green because I feel that is so important. I'm, as you guys know, a patient advocate. I talk all about protecting the patients through consumer safety. We have to protect our planet. So I feel just as strong that we need to, um, you know, while we're looking at consumer protection, look at the environment. In my mind, USDA organic, and from my understanding is that's a marketing for the most part versus clean green where that's literally environmental and consumer protection. And that's why it was made. It was not made for marketing. So I do see a lot of room, even if there is federal legalization for programs that are more for consumer protection than just for marketing from that organic stamp. Um, again, end product, we always want to look really for that uh, final product lab testing, regardless what we're doing. We also do have farms that have been certified organic that I've had a nurse shoot me a receipt for them using Eagle 20. So I would always say that final lab testing is the only way we can protect the patient, but that's also protecting the environment by knowing what our farmers are using. So always circling back to that full panel lab testing. And then one thing we do in a hospital setting is we allow spot inspections. As a nurse, you know, at any point, JCO or someone could come in as a regulatory body. So I would 
consider having spot inspections of farms and maybe giving a suggested list of allowables. So you're giving the guidance of this is what you're allowed to use instead of saying, oh, no, you're using that. Let's not use that. Let's make some of these really positive recommendations and put Vermont out on the right foot. So I just wanted to, again, speak to why I chose Clean Green. And I do feel, as Carrie asked, there is a lot of room for these third party organizations that are going to take it a bit further than the USDA organic program is allowed to or has been known to do. Um, and that plastic, that carbon reduction, the plastic rows that they allow in organic farming, let's let's do that different here in Vermont. We can do it a little bit better and we have this unique niche to do so. So thank you again. Just wanted to share as the first clean green um, certified farm here in Vermont. So. Thank you. Um, next up is Graham. Hey folks, can you hear me and see me? Yep. Yep. Great. Um, I know you've been hearing a lot from me today. Thanks for this marathon meeting with the great guests and a number of opportunities for public comment. Um, yeah, I really just going to comment on a number of things that were said. Um, there was a suggestion about uh, taking a deeper look at the hemp program, I believe, uh, Chair Pepper, you suggested that. And I think, you know, we, we fully support that and, and definitely recommend that you all do that. You know, our coalition did advocate that we that we do have an existing cannabis regulation program. It's it's our hemp program. And in fact, one of our coalition members, Trace, contracts with the state to administer its seed to sale tracking system. I know Carrie and Stephanie are there and, you know, I hope that you all do um, take a deep look into that. Um, the news about federal advancement has certainly been been making the rounds. Um, and, you know, I think hopefully from our perspective, we hope that we can be a model in Vermont for what this looks like, uh, what an equitable model for cannabis marketplace looks like. Um, I think, unfortunately, you know, our legislation is actually ranked very poorly nationally in terms of equity. If you saw the most recent Leafly um, survey, um, and, you know, we have good relationships with our federal delegation. We can bring them in. We can we can talk with those folks. Um, and we already do see some glaring inequities at, at the federal level. I believe I've heard already that those with felonies from um, cannabis will not be allowed to access the marketplace. So, you know, there's some ways that Vermont has already done better. And I think we can continue to try to do better than what a national program might um, offer. Carbon offsets and credits were mentioned. And I just, just wanted to say that from our perspective as an agricultural organization, um, both based on our national allies, the National Family Farm Coalition, global allies like La Via Campesina, we see carbon offsets and credits as, as a false carbon solution really marketed by corporations who don't want to be able to keep polluting. So I would encourage you to not engage with carbon offsets and credits and actually look at um, real means of reducing pollution. Um, in terms of, there was a suggestion just around technical assistance for growers. And I think that's just so important to think about that as we think about regulations. Um, there's a suggestion about weather contingencies from Jacob, I believe, and I think for outdoor growing in particular, and I think that was also a great recommendation. Really good questions around canopy size and how that will be interpreted and just making sure that we have that well articulated going into it so that no mistakes are made and people don't build their businesses on sort of um, unstable ground. Um, there are comments about promoting intercropping, and again, I think this it's going to be very hard to do intercropping on an existing farm if with the current zoning challenges. Um, uh, On-site processing and farm gate sales, gosh, that's so important. Um, direct market opportunities. These were mentioned by a couple of the guests, um, on-site processing, and you'll see in our recommendations, we do recommend a sort of small scale uh, farm um, integrated license where people could produce their own product, process their own product, and directly sell their own product. Um, I thought it was really interesting to talk about the use of pest the pesticide regs, not only by active ingredient, but by product name as well. Um, there was, a, uh, yep. Uh, in terms of the ag, ag use and legislative fears, uh, I just wanted to quickly get into that because um, you mentioned the concerns around MSOs coming in. You mentioned the concerns around youth and I think in running environment. And I think you know, we heard loud and clear today that there are APs that exist to um, help farmers and environmental regulations. We heard about some of the environmental impacts of indoor and how outdoor production will have a lot fewer environmental impacts in very different ways. In terms of MSO uh, impacts and impacts of money in terms of land use and land acquisition, um, 
production caps that we've recommended and a no horizontal license holding that's already incorporated into the law would do a lot to, I think, prevent that. Um, and lastly, I think in terms of the youth prevention focus call last week, I didn't hear anybody conflating outdoor production or smaller scale cultivation with youth use. Um, and I think as Sam said, the more people you can get into the legal market, the more accessible it comes. That means the more people you have selling by the regulations, um, selling visible to the public, carting people and not selling to youth. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Grant. Anyone else uh, want to make a public comment? Please just raise your virtual hand. Tito. Hey there. Um, so um, I would like to see um, some uh, an educative uh, education component for all the small outdoor growers that are um, that are going to be taking part. Um, you know, the, the, the runoff and, and lake quality problems are a serious problem. I haven't been able to take my dog to the lake for a while and I miss it. So maybe some like just a little bit of education about um, creating a healthy soil food web, uh, keeping liquid nutrients out of the equation. Um, and uh, I think that that would be really, really important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, well, uh, we have one last agenda item before we adjourn. Um, you know, we are going to engage with um, two consulting firms and to help us uh, develop our regulations and manage kind of the next phase of the board's work. Um, we've met a number of times, uh, both as a board and with these consulting firms. We've narrowed it down to two that we think would be good for us. Um, and so we're ready to take kind of a vote on um, starting the process of negotiating with them. So I would entertain a motion to, um, I think, Julie, you have a specific language mm -hmm. for that. So I'll move to authorize uh, Executive Director Bryn Hare to enter negotiations to, to contract with two consultants, uh, National Association of Cannabis Businesses and VS Strategies to negotiate scope of work as outlined in our request for services. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, so uh, that's it for today. We will be meeting again next Thursday, uh, probably um, 9.30 um, to you know, 2 or 3. Um, and we'll put out an agenda as soon as we have it a little bit more finalized uh, next week. So uh, with that, uh, I take a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, Kyle, can you stop the recording and get close out?